Chapter 102. Tessa. Looks like I'll be filling out these thank you cards to the guests who made last night's club opening such a big success, Kimberly says with a wry grin and a wave of an envelope when I enter the kitchen. What are the two of you planning for today? A look at the stack of cards she's already addressed and the pile she's still working on makes me wonder just how many businesses Christian has invested in if all those people she's writing to were partners of some sort. The size of this house alone has to mean he has more enterprises going on than just fans publishing and a single jazz club. I'm not sure. We'll figure it out when Hardin gets out of the shower, I tell her, and slide a fresh stack of small envelopes across the granite countertop. I had to force Hardin into the bathroom to take a shower alone. He was still irritated with me for locking him out of the bathroom while I took mine. No matter how many times I tried to explain to him how awkward I'd feel, if the Vances knew we were showering together in their home, he'd give me a weird little look and argue that we'd done much worse in their house than shower together over the past 12 hours. I stood my ground despite his pleading. The events in the gym were motivated by pure lust and were entirely unplanned. The love we made in my bedroom isn't an issue because it's my bedroom for now and I'm an adult having consensual sex with my, whatever it is that Hardin is to me right now. The shower thing, however, makes me feel differently. Being the stubborn man he is, Hardin still didn't agree, which led to me asking him to get me a glass of water from the kitchen. I pouted, and he fell for it. The moment he left the room, I jetted down the hall to the bathroom, locking the door behind me and ignoring his annoyed demands for me to let him in. You should make him take you sightseeing, Kimberly tells me. Maybe throwing yourselves into the culture of the city will help him with his decision to move here with you. This kind of weighty conversation is not something that I want to deal with right now. So Sasha seemed nice, I say, to not so covertly move the conversation away from my relationship issues. Kimberly snorts. Sasha? Nice? Not so much. She knows that Max is married, doesn't she? Of course she does. She licks her lips. But does she care? No, not at all. She likes his money and the expensive jewelry that comes along with seeing him. She could care less about his wife and daughter. The disapproval in Kim's voice is heavy, and I'm relieved to find that we're in agreement on the subject. Max is a jerk, but I'm still surprised that he'd have the nerve to bring her around other people. I mean, doesn't he care? if Denise or Lillian find out about her. I suspect that Denise already knows. With a guy like Max, there have been plenty of other Sashas over the years, and poor Lillian already despises her father, so it wouldn't make any difference if she knew. That's so sad. They've been married since college, right? I don't know how much Kimberly knows about Max and his family, but given her gossiping ways, I'm sure it's not nothing. They married right out of college, it was quite the scandal. Kimberly's eyes light up with the thrill of spilling such a juicy story to my unknowing ears. Apparently, Max was set to marry someone else, some woman whose family was close with his. It was basically a business deal. Max's father came from old money. I think that's at least part of why Max is such an asshole. Denise was heartbroken when he told her of his plan to marry another woman. Kimberly speaks as if she was actually present at the time all this was happening, instead of just passing along gossip. Maybe, though, that's what gossips always feel like. She takes a sip of water before continuing. Anyway, after graduation, Max rebelled against his father and literally left the woman waiting at the altar. On the very day of the wedding, he showed up at Trish and Ken's place in his tuxedo and waited outside the door until Denise came out. That same night, the five of them bribed a pastor, using a fancy bottle of scotch and the little bit of cash in their pockets. Denise and Max were married just before midnight, and she was pregnant with Lillian a few weeks later. My brain has a hard time picturing Max as a lovesick young man, rushing through the streets of London in a tuxedo, tracking down the woman he loved. The same woman that he now repeatedly betrays by hopping into bed with the likes of Sasha. I don't mean to intrude, but was Christian's I'm unsure what to call her. I mean, Smith's mother, was she with an understanding smile, Kimberly ends my awkward fumbling. 
Rose came along many years later. Christian was always the fifth wheel with the two couples. Once he and Ken stopped speaking and Christian came to America that's when Christian met Rose. How long were they married? I searched Kimberly's face for signs of discomfort. I don't want to intrude, but I can't help being fascinated by the history of this group of friends. I hope that. Kimberly knows me well enough by now not to be surprised by how many questions I'm prone to ask. Only two years. They'd only been dating a few months before she got sick. Her voice cracks, and she swallows, tears brimming in her eyes. He married her anyway she was taken down the aisle in a wheelchair by her father, who insisted on doing it. Halfway to the altar, Christian stepped down and pushed her the rest of the way. Kimberly breaks into sobs, and I brush away the tears that are falling from my eyes. I'm sorry, she says with a wan smile. I haven't told this story in a long time, and it just makes me so emotional. She reaches across the countertop to pull a wad of tissues from a box and passes one to me. Just thinking about it always shows me that behind his smart mouth and brilliant mind, there is an incredible loving man. She looks at me, then down at the stacks of envelopes. Shit, I got tears on the cards, she exclaims, recovering quickly. I want to ask her more questions about Rose and Smith, Ken, and Trish in their college days, but I don't want to push her. He loved Rose, and she healed him, even in her dying days. He only loved one woman his entire life, and she finally broke him of that. The story, as lovely as it is, only confuses me further. Who was this woman that Christian loved, and why did he need healing after this? Kimberly blows her nose and looks up. I turn to the doorway, where Hardin awkwardly glances back and forth between Kimberly and me, taking in the scene unfolding in the kitchen. Well, I obviously showed up at the wrong time, he says. I can't help but smile at how we must look, crying for no apparent reason, two massive stacks of cards and envelopes sitting in front of us on the countertop. Hardin's hair is wet from his shower, and his face is freshly shaven. He looks incredible in a plain black t-shirt and jeans. He's wearing nothing on his feet except socks, and his expression is wary as he silently beckons me to him. Should I expect you two for dinner tonight? Kimberly asks as I cross the room to stand at Hardin's side. Yes, I respond at the same time that Hardin says no. Kim laughs and shakes her head. Well, text me when you two come to an agreement. A few minutes later, as Hardin and I reach the front door, Christian suddenly pops out from a side room, sporting a huge grin. It's freezing outside. Where's your coat, boy? First off, I don't need a coat. Second, don't call me boy. Hardin rolls his eyes. Christian pulls a heavy navy blue pea coat from the rack next to the door. Here, wear this. It's like a damn heater in and of itself. Hell no, Hardin scoffs, and I can't help but laugh. Don't be an idiot. It's 20 degrees outside. Your lady may need you to keep her warm, Christian teases, and Hardin's eyes assess my thick purple sweater, purple coat, and purple beanie, which he hasn't stopped teasing me about, since I pushed it onto my head. I wore the same outfit the night that he took me ice skating, and he teased me then too. Some things never change. Fine, Hardin grumbles and pushes his long arms into the coat. I'm not surprised to find that he pulls off the look, even the large bronze buttons that line the front of the jacket somehow assume a masculine edge when mixed with Hardin's simple style. His new jeans, which I have grown really fond of, and his plain black t-shirt, black boots, and now this coat, make him look like he was plucked straight from the pages of a magazine. It's simply not fair the way he looks so effortlessly perfect. Stare much? I jump slightly at Hardin's words. In turn, I'm granted a smirk and a warm hand wrapped around mine. Just then, Kimberly rushes through the living room and into the foyer, followed by Smith, calling, wait. Smith wants to ask you something. She looks down at her soon, to be stepson with a loving smile. Go ahead, sweetie. The blonde boy looks directly at Hardin. Can you take a picture for my school thing? What? Hardin's face slightly pales, and he looks at me. I know how he feels about being photographed. It's sort of a collage he's doing. He said he wants your picture too, 
Kimberly tells Hardin, and I look over to him, pleading with him not to deny the boy who clearly idolizes him. Um, sure. Hardin shifts on his heels and looks at Smith. Contessa be in the picture too? Smith shrugs. I guess so. I smile at him, but he doesn't seem to notice. Hardin shoots me he likes me more than you and I don't even have to try look, and I discreetly elbow him as we walk into the living room. I pull the beanie from my head and use the band on my wrist to pull my hair back for the picture. Hardin's beauty is so unforced and natural. All he has to do is stand there with his uncomfortable frown on his face, and he looks perfect. I'll take it quickly, Kimberly says. Hardin moves closer to me and lazily hooks his arm around my waist. I give my best smile while he attempts to smile without showing his teeth. I nudge him and his smile brightens just in time for Kimberly to take the shot. Thank you. I can see that she's genuinely pleased. Let's go, Hardin says, and I nod, giving Smith a small wave, before following Hardin through the foyer to the front door. That was so nice of you, I tell him. Whatever. He smiles and covers my mouth with his. I hear the small click of a camera and pull away from him to find Kimberly with the camera again held to her face. Hardin turns his head to hide in my hair, and she takes another shot. Enough, shit. He groans and drags me out the door. What is with this family and their videos and pictures, he rambles on, and I close the heavy door behind me. Videos? I ask. Never mind. The cold air whips around us, and I quickly put my hair down and pull my hat back over my head. We'll take your car and get an oil change first, Hardin says over the howling wind. I dig into the front pockets of my coat to retrieve my keys to give to him, but he shakes his head and dangles his keychain in front of my face. It's now furnished with one key bearing a familiar green band. You didn't take your key back when you left all your gifts, he says. Oh my mind fills with the memory of leaving my most precious possessions in a pile on the bed we once shared. I'd like those things back soon, if that's okay. Hardin climbs into the car without another glance my way, mumbling over his shoulder, um, yeah. Sure. Once we're inside the car, Hardin turns the heat all the way up and reaches across to grab my hand. He rests both of our hands on my thigh, and his fingers trace a thoughtful pattern over my wrist, where the bracelet would normally rest. I hate that you left it there it should be here. He presses against the base of my wrist. I know. My voice is barely a whisper. I miss that bracelet every day, my e-reader too. I want the letter he wrote me back as well. I want to be able to read it over and over. Maybe you can bring them when you come back next weekend. I ask, hopeful. Yeah, sure, he says, but his eyes stay focused on the road. Why are we getting an oil change, anyway? I ask him. We finally make it out of the long driveway and turn onto the residential road. You need one. He gestures toward the small sticker on the windshield. Okay what? He glowers at me. Nothing. It's just an odd thing to do, to take someone's car, to get an oil change. I've been the only one taking your car for an oil change for months. Why would it surprise you now? He's right. He's always the one, to take my care for any type of maintenance it may need and sometimes I suspect he's being paranoid, and his things fixed or replaced that don't need to be. I don't know. I guess I forget that we were a normal couple sometimes, I admit, fidgeting in my seat. Explain. It's hard to remember the small normal things like oil changes, or the time you let me braid your hair. I smile at the memory. When we always seem to be going through some sort of crisis. First of all, he smirks, don't ever mention that hair braiding fiasco again. You know damned well that the only reason I let that happen was because you bribed me with head and cookies. He gently squeezes my thigh and a rush of heat flares under my skin. Second, I guess you're right in a way. It would be nice if your memories of me weren't tainted by my constant habit of fucking everything up. It's not only you. We both made mistakes, I correct him. Hardin's mistakes usually caused much more damage than mine, but I'm not innocent either. We need to stop blaming ourselves or each other and try to reach some sort of middle ground together. That can't happen if Hardin continues to beat himself up over every mistake he's made in the past. 
he has to find a way to forgive himself, so he can move on, and be the person I know he really wants to be. You didn't, he retorts, fighting back. Instead of the two of us going back and forth over who made mistakes and who didn't, let's decide what we're going to do with our day after the oil change. You'll get an iPhone, he says. How many times do I have to tell you that I don't want an iPhone I grumble? My phone is slow, yes, but iPhones are expensive and complicated, two things I can't afford to add to my life right now. Everyone wants an iPhone. You're just one of those people who don't want to give in to the trend. He looks over at me, and I see his dimples pucker evilly. That's why you were still wearing floor-length skirts in college. Finding himself absolutely hilarious, he fills the car with his laughter. I playfully scowl at his overused dig. I can't afford one right now anyway. I have to save my money for an apartment and groceries. You know, the necessities. I roll my eyes, but smile back at him to soften the blow. Imagine the things we could do if you had an iPhone too. There would be even more ways for us to communicate, and you know I'd get it for you, so don't mention the money again. What I can imagine is doing things like tracking my phone so you could see where I go, I tease, ignoring his overpowering need to buy me things. No, like we could video chat. Why would we do that? He looks at me as if I've grown another set of eyes and shakes his head. Because, imagine being able to see me each day on your shiny new iPhone screen. Images of phone sex and video chats immediately spring into mind, and I shamelessly run through shots of Hardin touching himself on the screen. What is wrong with me? My cheeks heat, and I can't help but glance at his lap. With one finger under my chin, Hardin tilts my face up to look at him. You're thinking about it going over all the dirty shit I could do to you via iPhone. No, I'm not. Holding tight to my stubborn refusal to get a new cell phone, I change the subject. My new office is nice the view is incredible. Is it? Hardin's tone immediately turns somber. Yes, and the view from the lunchroom is even better. Trevor's office has, I stop myself from finishing the sentence, but it's too late. Hardin is already glaring at me expecting me to finish. No, no. Continue. Trevor's office has the best view, I tell him, my voice coming out much more clear and steady than I'm feeling on the inside. Just how often are you in his office, Tessa? Hardin's eyes flicker to me and then back to the road. I've been there twice this week. We have lunch together. You what? Hardin snaps. I knew I should have waited until after dinner to bring up Trevor or not brought him up at all. I shouldn't even have mentioned his name. I have lunch with him, usually, I admit. Unfortunately for me, at that moment my car is stopped at a red light, leaving me no choice but to be at the receiving end of Hardin's glare. Every day? Yes is there a reason behind it? He's the only person I know that has the same lunch hour as me. Kimberly's so busy helping Christian that she hasn't even been taking a lunch hour. Both of my hands move in front of my face, to aid in my explanation. So have your lunch hour changed. The light turns green, but Hardin doesn't step on the gas pedal until an angry horn sounds from behind us in the line of traffic. I'm not having my lunch hour changed. Trevor is my co-worker, end of story. Well, Hardin breathes, I would prefer you not to eat lunch with fucking Trevor. I can't stand him. Laughing. I reach down onto my lap and place my hand on top of Hardin's. You're being irrationally jealous, and it happens that there's no one else for me to have lunch with, especially when the other two women that share the same lunch hour have been mean to me all week. He glances sideways at me while switching lanes smoothly. What do you mean, they've been mean to you? They haven't been mean exactly. I don't know, maybe I'm just paranoid. What happened? Tell me, he urges. It's nothing serious, I just get the feeling that they don't like me for some reason. I always catch the two of them laughing or whispering while staring at me. Trevor said they like to gossip, and I swear I heard them say something about how I got the job. They said what? Hardin sneers. His knuckles are white as he grips the steering wheel. They made a comment, something like we know how she got the job anyway. Did you say something to them? Or to Christian? No. I don't want to cause any problems. 
I've only been there a week, and I don't want to run and tattle on them like a schoolgirl. Fuck that. You need to tell those women to fuck off, or I'll tell Christian myself. What are their names? I may know them. It's not that big of a deal, I say, trying to deactivate the bomb I've clearly assembled myself. Every office has a set of catty women. The ones in mine just happen to have targeted me. I don't want this to be a thing. I just want to blend in there and maybe even make some friends. Not likely to happen if you continue to let them act like bitches and hang out with fucking Trevor all day. He licks his lips and takes a deep breath. I take an equally deep breath and look at him, debating whether or not to defend Trevor. Fuck it. Trevor is the only person there that makes any type of effort to be kind to me and I already know him. That's why I spend my lunch hour with him. I stare out the window and watch my favorite city in the world pass by as I wait for the bomb to explode. When Hardin doesn't respond, I look over at him and his laser stare at the road ahead, then add, I really miss Landon. He misses you, too. So does your dad. I sigh. I want to know how he is, but if I ask one question, it'll lead to 30. You know how I am. Worry blooms inside my chest, and I do my best to push it back down and lock it away. I do know, that's why I won't answer them. How's Karen? And your father? Is it sad that I miss those two more than I miss my own parents? I ask. No, considering who your parents are. He scrunches his nose. To answer your question, they're good, I guess. I don't really pay attention. I hope this place starts to feel like home soon, I say without thinking, and sink back into the leather seat. You don't seem to like Seattle so far, so what the hell are you doing here? Hardin pulls my car into the lot of a small building. Plastered on the front is a massive yellow sign. Promising 15-minute oil changes and friendly service. I don't know how to answer him. I'm afraid to share my fears and doubts about my recent move with Hardin. Not because I don't trust him, but because I don't want him to use them as an opening to push me to leave Seattle. I could really use a big pep talk right now, but, frankly, would settle for silence over the I told you, so I'm most likely to hear from Hardin. It's not that I don't like it here, I'm just not used to it yet. It's only been one week, and I'm used to my routine in Landon, and you, I explain. I'll pull into the line, and meet you inside, Hardin tells me without a word regarding my response. With a nod, I climb out of the car and hurry out of the cold and into the small mechanic shop. The scent of burned rubber and stale coffee fills the waiting room. I'm staring at a framed photograph of an old-fashioned car when I feel Hardin's hand come to rest on the small of my back. It shouldn't be too long. He takes my hand in his and leads me to the dusty leather couch in the center of the room. Twenty minutes later, he's on his feet, pacing back and forth across the black and white tiled flooring. A bell chimes through the room, signaling that someone has joined us. The sign outside says 15-minute oil change, Hardin snaps at the young man wearing oil-stained coveralls. Yeah, it does. The man shrugs. The cigarette tucked behind his ear falls down onto the counter, and he quickly retrieves it with a gloved hand. Are you shitting me? Hardin growls, his patience clearly grown thin. It's almost done, the mechanic assures him, before exiting the waiting room just as abruptly as he entered. I don't blame him. I turn to Hardin and rise to my feet. It's fine, we aren't in a hurry. He's wasting my time with you. I have less than 24 hours with you, and he's fucking wasting it. It's fine. I walk across the tile floor to stand in front of him. We're here together. I push my hands into the pockets of Christian's coat, and he presses his lips into a tight line to keep his frown from turning into a smile. If they aren't done within 10 minutes, I'm not paying for this shit, he threatens, and I shake my head at him and bury my head in his chest. Don't apologize to that guy for me either. He reaches under my chin with his thumb and lifts my head to look into my eyes. I know you're planning too. He places a soft kiss against my lips and I find myself hungry and anxious for more. The topics of discussion in the car have proven to be sore spots for us in the past, yet we made the entire drive here without a major blow-up. I'm surprisingly giddy over that, or maybe it's Hardin's warm arms wrapping around my waist, 
or his usual minty scent laced with Christian's cologne that he borrowed. Whatever it is, I'm aware of the fact that we're the only people waiting in this small shop, and I'm surprised by Hardin's affectionateness as he kisses me again. This time his lips press much harder, and his tongue swipes out to meet mine. My hands find their way into his hair, and I tug gently at the ends, making him groan and tighten his grip on my waist. He brings my body flush to his, his mouth still claiming mine, until the shrill sound of a bell goes off, making me jump away from him, and smooth my hand over my beanie out of nervousness alone. Ildun, the cigarette-toting man from minutes ago announces. About time, Hardin rudely remarks and pulls his wallet from his back pocket, shooting me a warning glare, when I do the same. Chapter 103. Hardin. He wasn't staring at me, she says, trying to convince me as we finally reach her car, which I was forced to park in the farthest possible spot away from the restaurant. He was panting over his lasagna. There was a line of drool hanging from his chin to prove it. The man's eyes were glued to Tessa the entire time that I tried to enjoy our overpriced oversauced pasta plate. I want to press it further, but I decide against it. She didn't even notice the man's attention. She was too busy smiling and talking with me to give him a second glance. Her smiles are bright and honest, her patience with my annoyed remarks about waiting too long for a table was remarkable, and she seems to always find a way to touch me. A hand on mine, a soft brush of her fingers over my arm, her soft hand brushing the mop of hair off my forehead, she's constantly touching me, and I feel like a fucking kid on Christmas. If I were to know how being excited on Christmas as a child actually felt. I turn the heat in the car to the highest setting, wanting to get her warmed up as quickly as possible. Her nose and cheeks are an adorable shade of red, and I can't help but lean over and run my cold hand across her quivering lips. Well, it's a shame that he'll be paying so much for drool-filled lasagna then, huh? She giggles, and I lean over to silence her corny remark by pressing my mouth to hers. Come here, I groan. I gently pull her onto my lap by the sleeves of her purple jacket. She doesn't protest. Instead, she climbs over the small barrier of armrests and onto my lap. Her mouth is steady on mine, and I possessively stake my claim by pulling her body as close to mine as the awkward design of this small car will allow. She gasps when I pull the lever on the seat to cause it to lie back, and her body falls onto mine. I'm still sore, she tells me, and I gently pull away from her. I just wanted to kiss you, I tell her. It's true. Not that I would turn down making love to her in the front seat of her car, but it wasn't on my mind at the time. I want to, though, she shyly admits, turning her head slightly, to hide from my view. We can go home well, to your place, why not here? Hello? Tessa? I wave my hand in front of her face, and she looks up at me, bewildered. Have you seen Tessa around anywhere, because this hormone-addled, sex-crazed woman wiggling in my lap, is certainly not her, I tease, and she catches on, finally. I'm not sex-crazed. She pats, pushing out her lower lip, and I lean up to catch it between my teeth. Her hips move against me, and I scan the parking lot. The sun has begun to set already, the thick air and cloudy skies making it appear to be even later than it actually is. The parking lot is nearly full of cars, though, and the last thing I want is someone catching us fucking in public. She pulls her mouth from mine and trails her lips down the column of my neck. I'm stressed, and you've been gone, and I love you. Despite the blasting heat pouring from the vents, a shiver rakes down my spine, and she reaches between us to palm me through my jeans. So maybe I'm a little hormonal, it's almost you know, that time. She whispers the last two words, as if they're a dirty secret. Oh, now I get it. I grin, concocting vulgar jokes in my mind to tease her with the entire week, the way I always do. She reads my mind. Don't say a word, she scolds, gently squeezing and kneading my cock, while her mouth moves against my neck. Then stop doing that, before I come in my pants. I've already done that too many times, since I met you. Yeah, you have. She bites down on my flesh, and my hips betray me, by lifting to meet her torturous whirling movements. Let's go back, if someone sees you like this, riding me in the middle of the parking lot, 
I'd have to kill them. Thoughtfully, Tessa glances around the parking lot, surveying the surroundings, and I watch as the realization of our location sinks in. Fine. She pouts again and climbs back into the passenger seat. Look how the tables have turned. I winces her handcuffs. Me again and squeezes. She sweetly smiles as if she didn't just make a mild attempt to castrate me. Just drive. I'll run every red light so I can get you home and give you your fix I tease her. She rolls her eyes and rests her head against the window. By the time we reach the next red light, she's fast asleep. I reach over to make sure she's still warm, tiny drops of sweat beat her forehead in her sleep, making me cut the heat off immediately. Deciding to enjoy the soft noises of her muted slumber, I take the long way back to Vance's house. I gently shake her shoulder to wake her. Tessa, we're back. Her eyes pop open, and she blinks rapidly to assess her location. It's already so late, she asks, glancing at the clock on her dashboard. There was traffic, I say. Truth is, I drove around the city, trying to find whatever it is that has her so captivated. It was a lost cause. I couldn't find it through the freezing air. Or the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Or the drawbridge causing that traffic. The only thing that made sense to me was the sleeping girl in my car. Despite the hundreds of buildings that line and light up the skyline, she's the only thing that could make this city worth a damn. I'm still so tired I think I ate too much. She half smiles and pushes me away when I offer to carry her to her room. She lumbers like a zombie through Vance's house, and the moment her head hits the pillow, she's asleep again. I carefully undress her and pull the duvet over her half-naked body, laying my worn t-shirt next to her head in hopes that she'll pull it on when she wakes. I stare over at her. Her lips are parted slightly, and her arms are wrapped around one of mine like she's holding a soft pillow instead of a hard arm. It can't be comfortable for her, but she's sound asleep, holding on to me, as if she's afraid I'll disappear. I think, maybe, if I continue to not be a fuck-up during the week, I'll be rewarded with times like this every weekend, and that's enough for me to hold on to until she can see how devoted I am to improving myself for her. How many times are you going to call me? I bark through the line. My phone has been buzzing all night and morning with my mum's name flashing on the screen. Tessa keeps waking up, and, in turn, waking me up. I swear I put the damn thing on silent the last time. You should have answered. I have something important to talk to you about. Her voice is soft, and I can't remember the last time I spoke to her. Get to it, then, I groan and instinctively lean up to turn the lamp on. The light from a small lamp is much too bright for this early hour, so I tug the string and return the room to its original state of darkness. Well, here goes she lets out a deep breath. Mike and I are going to be married. She squeals into the phone, and I move the device from my ear for a moment to save my hearing. Okay I say, expecting more. Aren't you surprised, she questions, obviously disappointed in my reaction. He told me he was going to ask you, and I figured you'd say yes. What is there to be surprised about? He told you? Yeah, I say, looking at the dark, rectangular shapes of some photos hanging on the wall. Well, what do you think about it? Does it matter? I ask her. Of course it matters, Harden. My mum sighs, and I sit up fully. Tessa stirs in her sleep and reaches for me. I don't care either way. I was a little surprised, but what do I care, if you get married? I whisper, wrapping my legs around Tessa's smooth legs. I'm not asking for your permission. I just wanted to see how you felt about the whole thing, so I could tell you the reason I've been calling you all morning. I'm fine with it, now tell me. As you know, Mike thought it would be a good idea to sell. The house. And? Well, it's sold. The new owners won't be moving in until next month, until after the wedding. Next month? I rub my temples with my index finger. I knew I shouldn't have picked up the damn phone this early. We were going to wait until next year, but neither of us is getting any younger, and with Mike's son going off to university, there's no better time than now. It should start warming up in the next few months, but we don't want to wait. It may be chilly, but it won't be unbearable. You'll come, won't you? And bring Tessa? 
So the wedding is next month, or in two weeks. My brain doesn't function this fucking early. Two weeks, she responds with glee. I don't think I can I trail off. It's not that I don't want to join the joyous festivities of a requited love and all that shit, but I don't want to go all the way to England, and I know Tessa isn't going to come along on such short notice, especially given the state of our relationship right now. Why not? I'll ask her myself if I, no, you won't. I cut her off. Realizing that I'm being a little harsh, I backtrack. She doesn't even have a passport. It's an excuse, but a truthful one. She can get one within two weeks, if they expedite it. I sigh. I don't know, mom, give me a little time to think about it. It's seven in the damn morning. I groan and end the call, then realize I didn't even say congratulations. Fuck. Well, it's not like she expected it from me necessarily. From down the hall, I hear someone scavenging through fucking cabinets. I pull the thick duvet over my head to drown out the noise of slamming and the obnoxious beeping of a dishwasher, but the noises don't abate. The cacophony continues until I guess I just fall asleep in spite of it. Chapter 104. Harden. It's a little past eight, and I can see through the living room to the kitchen, where Tessa is fully dressed, eating breakfast with Kimberly. Shit, it's Monday already. She has to go to work, and I have to drive back to school. I'll miss today's classes, but I couldn't care less. I'll have my diploma in less than two months. Are you going to wake him up? Kimberly asks Tessa just as I walk in. I'm up. I groan, still groggy from sleep. I slept more peacefully last night than I have all week. My first night here we were up nearly the entire night. Hey. Tessa's smile lights up the dim room, and Kimberly covertly slides off the high stool she's sitting on and leaves us alone. Which means she set a new record for not annoying me. How long have you been up? I asked Tessa. Two hours. Christian said I could have an extra hour, since you weren't awake. You should have woken me up earlier. My eyes greedily rake down her body. She's dressed in a deep red button-down shirt tucked into a solid black, knee-length pencil skirt. The material hugs her hips in a way that makes me want to bend her over the stool, push her skirt up to reveal her panties, lace panties, perhaps, and take her right here, right now she calls me out from my thoughts. What? The front door closes, and I'm relieved that we're finally alone in the massive house. Nothing, I lie and walk over to the half-full coffee pot. You think they'd have a Keurig, rich bastards. Tessa laughs at my remark. I'm glad they don't. I hate those things. She leans on her elbows on the kitchen island, and her hair falls down to frame her face. Me too. I glance around the spacious kitchen and back to Tessa's chest as she stands up straight. What time do you have? To leave? I ask. She crosses her arms in front of her chest, blocking my view. Twenty minutes. Damn it. I sigh, and we both bring our coffee mugs to our mouths at the same time. You should have woken me up. Tell Vance you're not coming in. No. She blows at the steaming cup of coffee in her hand. Yes. No, she says with a firm voice. I can't take advantage of my personal relationship with him like that. Her choice of words sends an unwelcome annoyance through me. It's not a personal relationship. You're staying here because you're friends with Kimberly, and ultimately because I introduced you to Vance in the first place I remind her, fully aware of just how annoyed she gets when I bring this up with her. Her blue-gray eyes roll back dramatically, and she strides across the rich hardwood flooring, her heels clicking loudly as she passes me. My fingers hook around her elbow, halting her dramatic exit. I pull her to my chest and press my lips against the base of her throat. Where do you think you're going? to my room to grab my bag she says. But the heavy rising and falling of her chest completely contradicts her cool tone and cooler gaze. Tell him you need more time, I demand, barely brushing my lips over the flushed skin below her neck. She tries to appear unaffected by my touch, but I know better. I know her body better than she does. No. She makes a minimal effort to pull away, just to be able to tell herself that she did. I don't want to take advantage of him. They're already letting me stay here for free. I'm not budging. I'll call him, then, I say. He doesn't need her at the office today. 
He already has her three days a week. I need her more than Vance Publishing does. Harden she reaches for my hand, before I can dig into my pocket, to retrieve my cell phone. I'll call Kim. She frowns, and I'm surprised, and very grateful, that she gave in so quickly. Chapter 105. Tessa. Kim. Hey, it's Tessa. I was, go ahead. She cuts me off. I already told Christian you probably wouldn't be in today. I'm sorry for asking. I, Tessa, it's fine. We get it. The sincerity in her voice makes me smile despite my annoyance with Hardin. It's nice to finally have a female friend. The weight of Steph's betrayal is something I'm having a hard time lifting from my chest. I look around my temporary bedroom and remind myself that I'm hours away from her, from that campus, from all the friends I thought I had made during my first semester at college, all of them fakes. This is my life now. Seattle is where I belong, and I'll never have to see Steph or any of them again. Thank you so much, I tell her. You don't have to thank me. Just remember that all the main rooms in the house are under surveillance. Kimberly laughs. I'm sure that after the gym incident you wouldn't forget that. My eyes dart up to Hardin as he enters the bedroom. His expectant grin and the way those dark blue jeans hang low on his hips distract me from Kimberly's words. I have to scramble to remember what she said only seconds ago. The gym? Oh God. My blood runs cold and Hardin stalks toward me. Um, yeah, I mumble, holding my hand up to stop Hardin from coming any closer. Have fun. Kimberly ends the call. They have cameras in the gym. They saw us. I say, panicking. Hardin shrugs as if it's no big deal. They turned them off before they saw anything. Hardin. They know what you know, in their gym. My hands fly through the air in front of me. I'm so mortified. I cover my face with my hands, but Hardin quickly removes them. They didn't see anything. I spoke to them already. Calm down. Don't you think I would have lost my shit if he'd actually seen anything on tape? I relax, slightly. He's right. He would have been much more upset than he appears to be right now, but that doesn't mean that I'm not completely humiliated by the fact that they know, even if they did stop the tape. But wait, what does tape even mean here? everything's digital. And they could have just said they stopped the cameras, but really all they did was just look away the footage it's not saved anywhere or anything, right? I can't help but ask the question. My fingertip traces over the small cross, tattoo on Hardin's hand. Hardin lowers his eyes at me defensively. What is that supposed to mean? Hardin's old hobbies flash through my mind. That's not what I meant, I say quickly. Maybe too quickly. You sure, he asks. I watch as his features harden, and his eyes fill with guilt. I mean, how would you know what I was worried you were thinking about, if you hadn't already been thinking about it yourself? Don't, I say strongly, and close the small space between us. Don't what, he asks. I can read his thoughts in this moment. I can see him reliving the terrible things he has done. Don't do that. Don't go back there. I can't help it. He rubs his hand down his face in a slow yet frenzied motion. Is that what you were thinking? That I knew about the tape, and that I let him watch it? What? No. I would never think that, I say honestly. I only connected the tape from the gym to to what happened before when you said something. It just reminded me of that, I never thought you were doing that now. My fingers wrap around the tattered neckline of his black t-shirt. I know you would never show anyone a tape of me. I stare into his eyes, willing him to believe me. If anyone ever did something like that to you, he takes a long pause and a deep breath. I don't know what I would do to them, even if it was Vance, he grimly admits. Hardin's temper is something I've grown very familiar with over the last six months. I stand on my tiptoes, so I can look him in the eyes. It won't happen. Something terrible almost did, though, only last week with Steph and Dan. A shudder shakes his shoulders, and I desperately search for the right thing, to say to him to pull him out of this dark place. Nothing happened. The irony of my being the one to comfort him now, when the trauma was actually something that happened to me, isn't lost on me, but this role reversal speaks true to the nature of our relationship and Hardin's need to blame himself for things he can't control. 
Just like his mother, just like me. I can see this now. If he had been inside you the words bring back vague flashes of memory from that night, images of Dan's fingers running up my thigh, of Steph pulling up my dress. I don't want to discuss the hypothetical. I lean into him, and his arms wrap around my waist, caging me, protecting me from bad memories and non-existent threats. He glowers. We've barely discussed it at all. I don't want to. We talked about it enough at my mother's house, and this is not how I want to spend my newly cleared afternoon. I give him the best smile I can manage in a failed attempt to lighten the mood. I couldn't bear anyone hurting you like that. I hate the thought of him violating you. It makes me murderous, all I see is red. I can't handle it. Hardin's angry expression has not lightened, only intensified. His green eyes burn into mine, and the rough grip of his fingers tightens on the span of my hips. Let's not talk about it, then. I want you to try and forget it, like I have. I caress his back with my fingers, gently begging him to forget the whole thing. It won't do either of us any good to harp on it. It was terrible and disgusting, but I won't let it rule me. I love you, I love you so, so much. His mouth catches mine, and I wrap my fingers around his arms, pulling him closer to me. Between breaths, I say, so focus on me, Harden. Only on him, I'm interrupted by the pressure of his mouth on mine again, possessing me, proving his commitment to both me and himself. His tongue is hard, pushing through my lips to massage mine. Harden's fingertips dig into my hips even further, and I whimper as his hands glide up my stomach to my chest. He cups my breasts, and I push into his body harder, filling his greedy hands. Show me that it's only me, he whispers into my mouth, and I know exactly what he wants, what he needs. I drop to my knees in front of him, and hastily tug at the lone button on his jeans. The zipper proves to be more of a problem, and I briefly consider ripping the jagged metal lining, and destroying it altogether. However, I can't bring myself to do this, considering how hot he looks in the tight blue jeans. My fingertips slowly graze over the light dusting of hair leading from his navel to the waistband of his boxers, and he groans impatiently. Please, he begs, no teasing. I give a small nod and pull down his boxers, letting them pull at his calves atop the bunched up jeans. Hardin groans once more, this time much louder, much more primal, and I take him into my mouth. Slow movements and flicks of my tongue, say the things, that I try to instill in his paranoid mind, reassuring him that these acts of pleasure are different from anything someone could force me into. I love him. I'm aware that what I'm doing now may not be the healthiest way to handle his anger and anxiety, but my need for him is stronger than my moral compass, which, at the moment, is smugly waving a self-help book in front of my face. I fucking love that I'm the only man who has had your mouth, he groans as I use one hand to take what my mouth cannot. Those lips have only been wrapped around me. A quick movement of his hips makes me gag, and he reaches down to run his thumb along my forehead. Look at me, he instructs. And I happily comply. I'm enjoying this just as much as he is. I always do. I love the way his eyelids fall closed with each long stroke of my tongue against him. I love the way he grunts, and groans when I add more suction. Fuck, you know exactly his head rolls back, and I can feel the muscles in his legs tightening under my hand, which I've rested on him to steady myself. I'm the only man who you'll ever be on your knees in front of I press my thighs together to relieve some of the tension his filthy mouth arouses in me. Hardin uses one hand to steady himself against the wall as my mouth brings him closer and closer to his high. I keep my eyes on his, knowing that it drives him absolutely crazy to watch me as I enjoy pleasuring him so much. His free hand moves down from the top of my head to my mouth, and he runs the pad of his thumb across my top lip, moving in and out of my mouth at a quickening pace. Fuck, Tess. His body goes rigid as he tells me how good it feels, how much he loves me, while he climbs closer to release. I take all of him, moaning while he's filling my mouth, and he groans, emptying himself on my tongue. I keep sucking, milking every drop of his release as he softly rubs my cheek with his thumb. I lean into his touch, reveling in its tenderness, and he gently helps me to my feet. The moment I'm standing next to him, he's pulling me into his arms, 
hugging me in an intimate gesture that almost overwhelms me. I'm sorry for dragging all that shit up, he whispers into my hair. SHH, I whisper back, not wanting to backtrack to the dark conversation we left behind only minutes ago. Bend over the bed, baby, Hardin says, and it takes me a moment to register his words. He doesn't give me an opportunity to respond before he's gently pushing his palm against the small of my back, guiding me to the edge of the mattress. His hands grip my thighs, pushing my skirt up my legs until my entire behind is bare to him. I want him so badly that it physically hurts. An ache that only he can soothe. As I move to step out of my shoes, he presses his palm against my back again. No, leave them on, he growls. I groan as my panties are pushed to the side, and he slides a finger inside of me. He steps closer, his legs nearly touching mine, his cock softly teasing the back of my legs. So soft, baby, so warm. He adds another finger, and I groan, leaning all my weight onto my elbows on the mattress. My back arches when he finds a rhythm, steadily entering me, dragging his long fingers into and out of me. Your sounds are so sexy, Tess, he coos, closing the gap between our bodies, so I feel his hard cock pressing against me. Please, Harden. I groan, needing him now. Within seconds he fills me in the way that only he has, and only he ever will. I lust for him, but it's nothing compared to the overwhelming, all-consuming, judgment-altering love that I have for him, and I know deep down, deep in the depth of me that only he and I can see that it will always be only him. Later, as we are lying in bed, Hardin whines, I don't want to go, and in a very unhardened like gesture, he leans his head down and buries it in my shoulder, wrapping his arms and legs around my body. His big hair tickles my skin. I try to tame it with my fingers, but there is simply too much of it. I need a haircut, he announces, as if answering my thoughts. I like it this way. I gently tug at the damp strands. You wouldn't tell me if you didn't, he says, calling me out. He's right, but only because I couldn't imagine a hairstyle on Hardin that wouldn't flatter him. Still, I do happen to love his hair this length. Your phone is ringing again, I point out, and he lifts his head to shoot me a glare. Something could be wrong with my father, and I'm trying my best not to freak out, and I really want to trust you, so please just answer it, I rattle out. If it's something with your father, Landon can handle it, Tessa. Hardin, you know how hard it is for me not? Tessa, he says to silence me, but then he climbs off the bed and retrieves the vibrating phone from the desk. See? It's my mum. He holds the screen up, so the word Trish is clear from where he stands. I really wish he'd listen to me and change her entry to mom and his phone, but he refuses. Baby steps, I remind myself. Answer it. It could be an emergency. I climb off the bed and try to grab the phone from his quick hands. She's fine. She's been pestering me all morning. Hardin childishly holds the phone up over my head. About what? I ask him, and watch as he turns the power off on the device. Nothing important. Do you know how annoying she can be? She's not annoying, I say in Trisha's defense. She's very sweet, and I love her sense of humor. Something which her son could use more of. You're just as annoying as she is. I knew you would say that. He grins. His long fingers reach out to tuck my hair behind my ears. I give him a fake evil eye. You're being awfully charming today. Aside from calling me annoying just now, of course. I'm not complaining, but given our history, I'm afraid that this behavior will disappear when our blissful weekend has ended. Would you prefer me to be an asshole? He raises a brow. I smile, enjoying his playful behavior, no matter how briefly it lasts. Chapter 106. Harden. As if the long-ass drive through the freezing rain wasn't pleasant enough, when I get back to my apartment, I'm bombarded with a disturbing image of Tess's dad sprawled out on my couch, wearing my clothes. My cotton pajama pants and black t-shirt are way too tight on him, and I can literally taste the bagel Tessa fed me this morning rising in the back of my throat, just begging to be regurgitated onto the concrete floor. How's Tessie doing? Richard asks me the moment I walk in the door. Why are you wearing my clothes, again? I groan, 
not necessarily expecting an answer from the man, but knowing I'm going to get one anyway. I only have that one shirt you gave me, and I couldn't get the smell out of it, he replies, rising to his feet. Where's Landon? Landon's in the kitchen. My stepbrother's voice carries into the living room from behind me. A moment later he joins us, a dish towel in his hands. Drops of soap fall to the floor, and I scowl at him for not making Richard do the damn dishes. So how is she, he asks. She's good. Fuck. In case anyone was wondering, I'm good too, I gripe. The apartment is much cleaner than it was when I left it. The stacks of shitty manuscripts that I had planned to throw away are now gone, the tower of empty water bottles I had built on the coffee table is nowhere to be seen, and even the dust mound that I've grown used to watching grow has disappeared from the corners of the television stand. What the fuck happened in here? I ask both of them. My patience is wearing too thin, given that I've only been in this apartment for a couple of minutes. If you mean what happened, as in why did we clean the place, Landon begins, but I cut him off. Where's all my shit? I pace across the floor. Did I ask either of you to touch any of my shit? My fingers move to pinch the bridge of my nose, and I take a deep breath in an attempt to control my sudden anger. Why would they just clean my fucking apartment without asking me first? I look back and forth between the two of them before stalking off to my bedroom. Someone's in a mood, I hear Richard remark just as I reach the door. Just ignore him he misses her, Landon quickly says. As a fuck you to both of them, I slam the door as loudly as possible. Landon is right. I know he is. I could feel it as I drove away from that damn city, away from her. I could feel every single tendon and muscle in my body tighten the farther I got from her. Every single fucking mile wide in the gaping hole inside of me. A hole that only she can fill. Cursing at every asshole on the highway helped maintain my temper at a slow burn, but it wasn't going to suffice for long. I should have stayed in Seattle a few more hours, convinced her to take the week off and come home with me. With the way she was dressed, I shouldn't have given her a choice. The more I sink into my thoughts, the more I find myself visualizing her half-naked body. Her skirt was bunched up around her waist, creating the sexiest sight. As I rocked into her repeatedly, she promised not to forget me during the long week ahead and told me how much she loved me. The more I think about the way she kissed me and then kissed me again, the more agitated I become. My need for her is stronger than it's ever been. It's lust and love melted together, no, the need I have for her goes much deeper than lust. The way we're connected while making love is indescribable, the sounds she makes, the way I'm reminded that I'm the only man who has ever made her feel that way. I love her, and she loves me, end of fucking story. Hey, I say into the receiver, having called her, before I even realized what I was doing. Hey. Is something wrong? She asks. No. I look around my bedroom. My newly tidied bedroom. Yes. What's wrong? Are you home? No, it's not home. You're not here. Yeah, and your fucking dad and Landon are on my last fucking nerve. She lets out a little chuckle. It's been, what, like probably 10 minutes you've been home. What did they do already? They cleaned the entire apartment, moved all my shit around. I can't find anything. I wish there was a dirty shirt on the floor or something I could kick. What are you looking for, she asks, but in the background I hear another voice on her end. It takes everything I have not to ask her who the hell she's with. Nothing specific, I admit. But what I'm saying is that, if I did want to find something, I wouldn't be able to. She laughs. So you're mad that they cleaned up the apartment and you can't find something you're not even looking for? Yeah, I say with a grin. I'm being a fucking baby, and I know it. She knows it too, but instead of chastising me, she giggles. You should go to the gym. I should drive back to Seattle and fuck you over your bed. Again, I fire back. She gasps, and the sound resonates deep inside me, making the need for her stronger. Um, yeah, she whispers. Who's with you? I lasted about 40 seconds there. Progress. Trevor and Kim, she replies slowly. You've got to be kidding me. Fucking Trevor is always around. He's becoming more of a nuisance than said, and that's saying a fucking lot. 
hard and I can tell she's uncomfortable and she doesn't want to explain herself in front of them. Theresa. I'm going to go to my room for a minute. She politely excuses herself and while I listen to her breathing, I grow more and more impatient. Why is fucking Trevor at your house? I say, sounding more like a lunatic than I'd planned on. This isn't my house, she reminds me. Yeah, well, you live there and, she interrupts me. You should go to the gym. You're obviously wound up. I can hear the concern in her voice, and the silence that follows proves her point. Please, Hardin. There's no way I can say no to her. I'll call you when I get back I agree and hang up the phone. I can't say that I didn't see fucking Trevor's fucking annoying, model fucking like face imprinted on the black bag as I kicked, punched, kicked, punched for two hours straight. But I also can't say that it helped, not really. I'm still just revved up. I don't even know why I'm annoyed, except that Tessa isn't here and I'm not there. Fuck, this is going to be a long week. A text from Tessa is waiting for me when I reach my car. I hadn't expected to work out for so long, but I clearly needed it. Been trying to stay awake, but I'm worn out her message reads. I'm thankful for the darkness outside that conceals the stupid ass grin on my face from her corny innuendo. She's so damn endearing without even trying. I nearly ignore a message from Landon reminding me that I'm running low on groceries. I haven't bought actual groceries for myself since ever. When I lived in the frat house I just ate the shit that other people bought. However, Tessa may be upset if she finds out I'm not feeding her dad and Landon won't hesitate to tattle on me somehow I find myself pulling into Target instead of Connors for groceries. Tessa is clearly influencing me without even being here. She spends just as much time at Connors as she does at Target, even though she can go on for hours explaining to me why Target is much better than any other store. She even expresses this while we're in the middle of Connors. It annoys the shit out me, but I've learned to nod at the exact right moments to make her think I'm listening and partly agreeing with her. Just as I toss a box of frosted flakes into a shopping cart, a flash of red hair appears at the end of the aisle. I know it's Steph before she turns around. Her skanky thigh-high black boots with red laces are a dead giveaway. Quickly, I go over the two options here. One, I can walk over and remind her what a stupid fucking she turns to face me before I can go over the second option, which I probably would have preferred. Harden. Wait. Steph's voice sounds loud when I turn on my heel and leave the cart in the middle of the aisle. Regardless of the hard workout I just completed, there's no way that I could possibly control myself around Steph. No fucking way. I can hear the heavy thud of her boots against the laminate floor as she follows me despite my obvious attempt at avoiding her. Listen to me, she yells when she gets right behind me. When I stop walking, she collides with my back and falls to the floor. I spin and growl at her. What the fuck do you want? She quickly scrambles to her feet. I notice that her black dress is now dusted white from the dirty floor. I thought you were in Seattle. I am, just not at the moment, I lie. I'm not sure what possessed me to even try to keep a front up with her, but it's too late to backtrack now. I know you hate me now, she begins. First smart thought you've had in a while, I snap at, then get a good look at her. Her green eyes are nearly non-existent, what with the thick lines of black circling them. She looks like shit. I'm not in the mood for your crap, I warn her. You never have been. She smiles. I clench my fists at my sides. I don't have shit to say to you, and you know how I get when I don't want to be bothered. You're threatening me? Really? She raises her arms in front of her, then drops them back down. I stay quiet as images of a barely conscious Tessa swarm my mind. I need to get away from Steph. I would never hurt her physically, but I know all the shit to say to cut her much deeper than anything she could imagine. It's one of my many talents. She isn't good for you, Steph has the nerve to say. I can't help but laugh at the audacity of this bitch. You weren't stupid enough to try to discuss this with me. But Steph has never been anything, if not sure of herself. Full of herself. You know it's true. She isn't enough for you, and you're never going to be enough for her. The heat inside me turns from a simmer to a raging boil as she continues, you're going to get bored with her prudish behavior 
And you know it. You're probably already bored. Prudish. I bark another laugh. She doesn't know the Tessa who likes to be fucked in front of a mirror and fucks herself on my fingers until she screams my name. Steph nods. And she'll get over this bad boy fetish she's got with you and marry a banker or some shit. You can't be stupid enough to think she's in this for the long run. I knew you saw how she was with Noah, that douch bag made of cardigans. They were like the poster couple for people who belong together, and you know it. You can't compete with that. And what? You're implying that you and I would be better? My voice comes out sounding much less demanding than I planned. She's prying at my biggest insecurities, and I'm trying my best not to falter. She rolls her raccoon eyes. No, of course not. I know you don't want me, you never did. My point is, I care about you, she says. I look away from her to scan the empty aisles. I know you don't want to believe me, and I know you want to wring my neck for messing with your Virgin Mary, but in that dark heart of yours, you know what I'm saying is true. I bite the inside of my cheek at the nickname that my so-called friends branded Tessa with early on. Deep down, you know it won't work. She's too silver spoon for you. You're covered in ink, and it's only a matter of time before she's sick of being embarrassed to be seen with you. She's not embarrassed to be seen with me. I take a step toward the redeated harpy. You know she is. She even told me she was when you two first started dating. I'm sure that hasn't changed. She smiles. Her nose ring glistens under the lighting, and I cringe at the memory of her hands touching me, making me come. I swallow back bile and speak. You're trying to manipulate me, because that's all you have to work with, and I'm not buying it. I push past her. She croaks out a gross little laugh. If you were enough for her, then why did she run to Zed so many times? Do you know what people were saying? I stopped dead in my tracks. I remember Tessa coming back from that lunch with Steph. She was so upset, after she left Applebee's the day, that Steph brought Molly along, and the two of them hinted to Tessa that there were rumors going around that she fucked Zed. I was enraged enough to call Molly and warn her not to fucking try to come between Tessa and me. Steph obviously didn't get the message, even though it was her I needed to worry about the entire time. You made up those rumors I accuse. No Zed's roommate did. He's the one who heard her moaning his name and heard Zed's bed smacking against the wall while he was trying to sleep. Annoying, right? Steph's malevolent grin snaps every bit of self-control I've managed to hang on to since Tessa left for Seattle. I need to walk away now. I need to walk away now. Zed said she was nice and tight, though, and apparently she does this like thing with her hips or something. Oh, and that freckle you know the one. Her black nails tap against her chin. I can't handle it. Shut up. I cover my ears with my hands. Shut the fuck up. I scream through the aisle, and Steph backs away, still grinning. Believe me or not. She shrugs. I don't care, but you know it's a waste of time. She's a waste of time. She sneers, disappearing just as my fist connects with metal shelving. Chapter 107. Hardened boxes fall from the shelves and tumble onto the floor in a blur. I connect with the metal again, leaving a thick red stain behind. The familiar sting of splitting flesh across my knuckles only heightens the rush of my adrenaline, pushing me further into my rage. It's almost soothing, the relief of allowing myself to express my anger in the way I've always been used to. I don't have to stop myself. I don't have to overthink my actions. I can surrender to the anger, let it spill out, allow it to pull me under. What are you doing? Someone come help, a woman yells. When I snap my head away, she takes a step backward into the wide opening at the aisle's end, and I notice a little blonde-haired girl clinging to her skirt. The woman's eyes are wide with fear and caution. When the little girl's bright blue eyes meet mine, I can't look away. The innocence in their depths is being stolen with every angry breath that leaves my body. I break the hold of the girl's gaze and look toward the mess I've made in the aisle. Disappointment replaces rage in an instant, and the realization that I'm destroying shit in the middle of a target hits me hard. If the cops arrive, before I can get out of here, I'm fucked. With one last look toward the little girl in her floor-length dress and sparkling shoes, I rush down the aisle and toward the front of the store. 
avoiding the chaos that is brewing around me, I cross from aisle to aisle, staying as much out of sight as possible. I can't think clearly. Not a single thought makes sense to me. Tessa didn't fuck said. She didn't. She couldn't have. I would know if she did. Someone would have told me. She would have told me. She's the only person I know who doesn't lie to me. I burst outside, and the winter air is unforgiving as it bites at my skin. I keep my eyes focused on my car, which is parked toward the back of the lot, thankful to be shielded by the darkness of the night. Fuck. I scream once I reach my car. My boot collides with my bumper, and the grinding noise of metal bending out of place ratchets up my feeling of frustration. She's only been with me. I say out loud, then hop inside the car. I'm pushing the key into the ignition just as two police cars pull into the parking lot with lights blazing and sirens howling. I pull out of the space slowly to avoid any unwanted attention and watch as they park on the curb and rush inside like a murder has been committed. The moment I make it out of the parking lot, relief floods through me. If I'd been arrested at Target, Tessa would have flipped shit on me. Tessa said. I know better than to believe Steph's bullshit lies about Tessa fucking him. I know she didn't. I know that I'm the only man who has ever been inside of her, the only one who has ever made her come. Not him. Not fucking anyone. Only me. I shake my head to rid myself of the vision of the two of them, her fingers wrapped around his arms as he pushes into her. Fuck, not this again. I literally can't think straight. I can't see straight. I should have wrapped my hands around Steph's neck and no, I can't allow myself to finish the thought. She got exactly what she wanted out of me, and that makes me even angrier. She knew exactly what she was doing when she mentioned said. She was purposely taunting me, trying to make me snap, and it worked. She knew she was pulling the pin from a grenade and walking away. But I'm not a grenade, I should be able to control myself. I immediately call Tessa, but she doesn't pick up. Her phone rings and rings and rings. She did tell me that she was going to sleep, but I know damn well that her phone is always on vibrate and that woman can't sleep through shit. Come on, Tess, pick up the phone, I groan and toss my cell onto the passenger seat. I need to get as far away from Target as possible before the cops check the parking lot cameras and get my plate number or some shit. The freeway is a fucking nightmare and I keep trying to call Tessa. If she doesn't get back to me within the hour, I'm calling Christian. I should have stayed in Seattle another night. Hell, I should have moved there in the fucking first place. All of my reasons for not wanting to go seem so fucking pointless now. All of the fears I had and still have are only being kept alive by the distance between where she lives and where I live. Deep down you know it won't work. You're covered in ink and it's only a matter of time before she's sick of being embarrassed to be seen with you. Bad boy fetish. Marry a banker or some shit. Steph's voice pierces my ears over and over again. I'm going insane, I'm literally losing my fucking mind on this wide open road. All the efforts that I made all week mean nothing now. The two days that I spent with Tessa have been ruined by that viper. Is all of this worth it? Is all of this constant trying worth it? Will I always have to stop myself from saying or doing the wrong shit? And if I do continue this potential transformation, Will she really love me after, or just feel like she finished some kind of project for a side class? After all this, will there be enough of me left for her to love? Will I even be the same man that she fell in love with, or is this her way of transforming me into someone she wishes I could be, someone she will tire of? Is she trying to make me more like him more like Noah? You can't compete with that Steph is right. I can't compete with Noah in the simple relationship Tess has shared with him. She never had to worry about anything when she was with him. They were good together. Good and simple. He isn't broken the way that I am. I remember the days when I used to sit in my room and wait hours for Steph to tell me when Tessa returned after she'd spent some time with him. I interfered as much as I could and, surprisingly enough, it worked out for me. She chose me over him, over the boy she grew up loving. The idea of Tessa telling Noah she loves him makes me sick to my stomach. Bad boy fetish I'm more than a fetish to Tessa. I have to be. I fucked more than my share of girls who were only looking to frighten their daddies, but Tessa isn't one of them. 
She's put up with enough shit from me to prove that. My thoughts are jumbled and frantic, and I can't keep up with them. Why am I letting Steph get inside my head? I shouldn't have listened to a word that bitch said. Now that I have, though, I can't get her words out of me. I wipe my bloody and busted knuckles across the legs of my blue jeans and park the car. When I look up, I find myself parked in the lot of blind bobs. I've driven all the way here without, so much as a thought about it. I shouldn't go inside, but I can't stop myself. And behind the bar, I see an old friend. Carly. Carly, wearing minimal clothing, and deep red lipstick. Well 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 she grins at me. Save it. I groan and slide onto a bar stool directly in front of her. Not a chance. She shakes her head, her blonde ponytail whipping back and forth. The last time I served you, it spiraled into one big drama fest, and I have neither the time, nor the patience for a repeat performance tonight. The last time I was here, I got so shit-faced that Carly forced me to spend the night on her couch, which only led to a huge misunderstanding with Tessa, who got into a car accident that day because of me. Because of the shit I bring into her otherwise clean life. Your job is to get me a drink when I order one. I pointed the bottle of dark whiskey on the shelf behind her. There's a sign right there that states otherwise. She leans her elbows onto the bar top, and I sit back on my bar stool, creating as much space between us as possible. The small we have the right to refuse service to anyone is taped to the wall, and I can't help but laugh. Easy on the ice, I don't want it watered down. I ignore another of her eye rolls as she pushes herself up and grabs an empty glass. A thick stream of dark liquor pours into my glass, and Steph's voice replays again and again in my brain. This is the only way to rid myself of her accusations and lies. Carly's voice breaks me from my daze. She's calling. Glancing down, I see the picture that I snapped while Tessa was asleep this morning, it's flashing on my phone screen. Fuck. I instinctively push the glass away, spilling its freshly poured contents onto the bar top. I ignore Carly's high-pitched cursing and leave the bar just as quickly as I arrived. Outside, I swipe my thumb across the screen. Tess. Harden. She says, panicked. Are you okay? I called you so many times. I let out a breath of relief at the sound of her voice through the small speaker. I know, I'm sorry. I was asleep. Are you okay? Where are you? Blind Bob's I admit. There's no use in lying she always finds out the truth one way or another. Oh she barely whispers. I ordered a drink. I may as well tell her everything. Only one? Yes, and I didn't get the chance to even taste it before you called. I can't decide how I feel about that. Her voice is my lifeline, but I can feel a threat of something calling me back to the bar as well. That's good, then, she says. Are you leaving there? Yes, right now. I pull the handle on my car door and climb into the driver's seat. After a few beats, Tessa asks, would you go there? It's okay that you did I'm just wondering why. I saw Steph. She gasps. What happened? Did you did anything happen? I didn't hurt her, if that's what you mean. I turn on my car, but keep it in park. I want to talk to Tessa without the distraction of driving. She said some shit to me that really it really set me off. I lost my temper in Target. Are you okay? Wait, I thought you hated Target. Out of all the things I begin. Sorry. I'm half asleep. I can hear the smile in her voice, but it's quickly replaced by worry. Are you okay? What did she say? She said that you fucked said, I tell her. I don't want to repeat the other shit she said about Tessa and me not being good for each other. What? You know that's not true. Harden. I swear nothing happened between us, that you don't already, I tap a finger on the windshield, watching my fingerprints accumulate. She said his roommate heard you. You don't believe her, right? You couldn't possibly believe her, Hardin. You know me, you know I would have told you, if anyone else had touched me, her voice cracks, and my chest aches. SHHH I shouldn't have let her go on about it for so long. I should have told her, that I knew it wasn't true. But being the selfish bastard that I am, I needed to hear her say it. What else did she say? She's crying. Just bullshit. About you and said. 
And she played on every fear and insecurity that I have about us. Is that why you went to the bar? There's no judgment in Tessa's voice, only an understanding that I wasn't expecting. I guess so. I sigh. She knew things. About your body things that only I should know. A shiver rakes down my spine. She was my roommate. She saw me change any number of times, not to mention she's the one who undressed me that night, she says with a sniffle. Anger ripples through me again. The thought of Tessa, unable to move, while Steph forcefully undressed her don't cry please. I can't bear it, not when you're hours away, I beg her. Now that Tessa's soft voice is on the line, Steph's words seem to hold no truth, and the madness, the pure fucking madness, that I felt only minutes ago has dissolved. Let's talk about something else, while I drive home. I shift my car into reverse, and put Tessa on speakerphone. Okay, yeah she says, then hums a little while she thinks. Um, Kimberly and Christian invited me to join them at their club this weekend. You aren't going. If you would let me finish, she scolds me. But since you will hopefully be here, and I knew you wouldn't come along, we agreed on me going Wednesday night instead. What kind of club is open on a Wednesday? I glance into my rearview mirror, answering my own question. I'm going, I say. Why? You don't like clubs, remember? I roll my eyes. I'll go with you this weekend. I don't want you to go Wednesday. I'm going on Wednesday. We can go again this weekend if you'd like, but I already told Kimberly that I'm coming, and there's no reason that I shouldn't. I would rather you not go, I say through my teeth. I'm already on edge, and she's testing me. Or I can come Wednesday too, I offer, trying my best to be reasonable. You don't have to drive all the way here on Wednesday, when you'll already be coming for the weekend. You don't want to be seen with me? The words are out before I can stop them. What? I hear the click of her lamp turning on in the background. Why would you say that? You know it's not true. Don't let Steph in your head. That's what this is about, isn't it? I pull into the parking lot of the apartment and park the car before I respond. Tessa waits in silence for an explanation. Finally I sigh. No. I don't know. We have to learn to fight together, not against one another. It shouldn't be Steph versus you versus me. We have to be in this together, she continues. That's not what I'm doing. She's right. She's always fucking right. I'll come on Wednesday and stay until Sunday. I have classes and work. It sounds like you don't want me to come. My paranoia seeps through my already broken confidence. Of course I do. You know I do. I savor the words, fuck, I miss her so much. Are you home yet? Tessa asks just as I turn off the ignition. Yes, I just got here. I miss you. The sadness in her voice stops me in my tracks. I miss you too, baby. I'm sorry, I'm going crazy without you, Tess. I am too. She sighs, and it makes me want to apologize again. I'm a dumbass for not coming to Seattle with you in the first place. Coughing sounds through the speaker. What? Do you heard me? I'm not repeating it. Fine. She finally stops coughing as I step onto the elevator. I know I couldn't have heard you correctly anyway. Anyway, what do you want me to do about Steph and Dan? I change the subject. What can you do, she quietly asks. You don't want me to answer that. Nothing, then, just leave them be. She's probably going to tell everyone about tonight and continue to spread the rumor about you and said. I don't live there anymore. It's okay, Tessa says, trying to convince me. But I know how much a rumor like this will hurt her feelings, whether she admits it or not. I don't want to leave it alone, I confess. I don't want you getting in any trouble over them. Fine, I say, and then we exchange our good nights. She's not going to agree to my ideas on how to stop Steph, so I'll just drop it. I unlock the door to my apartment and walk in to find Richard sprawled out asleep on the couch. Jerry Springer's voice fills the entire apartment. I turn the television off and go straight to my bedroom. Chapter 108. Harden. The entire morning I'm dead on my feet. I don't remember walking into my first class, and I begin to wonder why I even bother. When I walk past the administration building, 
Nate and Logan are standing at the bottom of the steps. I pull my hood up and pass them by without a word. I have to get the hell away from this place. In a split-second decision, I turn back around and take the steep flight of stairs up to the front of the building. My father's secretary greets me with the fakest smile I've seen in a while. Can I help you? I'm here to see Ken Scott. Do you have an appointment? The woman sweetly asks, knowing damn well that I don't. Knowing damn well who I am. Obviously not. Is my father in there or not? I gesture to the thick wooden door in front of me. The fog glass in the center of it makes it hard to tell if he's inside. He's in there, but he's on a conference call at the moment. If you have a seat, I'll, I walk past her desk and go straight to his door. When I turn the knob and push it open, my father's head turns my way and he calmly raises a finger to ask me to give him a moment. Being the polite gentleman that I am, I roll my eyes and take a seat in front of his desk. After another minute or so, my father returns the phone to its face and rises to his feet to greet me. I wasn't expecting you. I wasn't expecting to be here, I admit. Is something wrong? His eyes move to his closed door. Behind me and back to my face. I have a question. I rest my hands on his almost maroon cherrywood desk and look up at him. Dark patches of stubble are visible on his face, making it obvious that he hasn't shaved in a few days and his white button-down shirt is slightly wrinkled at the cuffs. I don't think I've seen him wearing a wrinkled shirt since I moved to America. This is a man who comes to breakfast in a sweater vest and pressed khakis. I'm listening, my father says. The tension between us is abundant, but even so, I have to struggle to remember the searing hate that I once felt toward this man. I don't know how to feel about him now. I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive him completely, but holding on to all that anger toward him simply takes too much fucking energy. We'll never have the relationship that he has with my stepbrother, but it's sort of nice to know that, when I need something from him, he usually tries his best to help. The majority of the time, his help doesn't get me anywhere, but the effort is appreciated, somewhat. How hard do you think it will be for me to transfer to the Seattle campus? His brow rises dramatically. Really? Yes. I don't want your opinion, I want an answer. I make it clear that my sudden change of mind isn't open for discussion. He eyes me thoughtfully before answering. Well, it would set your graduation back. You're better off staying at my campus for the remainder of the semester. By the time you apply to transfer, register, and move to Seattle, it wouldn't be worth the hassle and time logistically speaking. I sit back against the leather chair and stare at him. Couldn't you help speed the process along? Yes but it would still put off your graduation date. So basically I have to stay here. You don't have to, he rubs the dark stubble on his chin, but it makes more sense for now. You're so close. I'm not attending that ceremony, I remind him. I had hoped you changed your mind. My father sighs, and I look away. Well, I haven't, so it's a very important day for you. The last three years of your life, I don't give a shit. I don't want to go. I'm fine with having my diploma mailed to me. I'm not going, end of discussion. My eyes travel up the wall behind him to focus on the frames hanging heavily on the dark brown walls of his office. The white frame certificates and diplomas mark his achievements, and I can tell by the way he proudly stares up at them that they mean more to him than they ever would to me. I'm sorry to hear that. He continues to stare at the frames. I won't ask again. My father frowns. Why is it so important to you for me to go? I dare to ask. The hostility between us has thickened, and the air has grown heavier, but my father's features soften tremendously as the moments of silence between us go by. Because, he draws in a long breath, there was a time, a long time, when I wasn't sure, another pause, how you would turn out. Meaning? Are you sure you have time to talk right now? His eyes move to my busted knuckles and blood-stained jeans. I know he really means, are you sure you're mentally stable enough to talk right now? I knew I should have changed my jeans. I didn't feel like doing much of anything this morning. I literally rolled out of bed and drove to campus. I want to know, I sternly reply. He nods. There was a time 
when I didn't think you'd even graduate high school, you know, given the trouble you always got into. Flashes of bar fights, burglarized convenience stores, crying half-naked girls, complaining neighbors, and one very disappointed mother play before my eyes. I know, I agree. Technically, I'm still into trouble. My father gives me a look that says he's not at all pleased to hear me being a little flippant over what was a substantial headache for him. Not nearly as much, he says. Not since her, he adds softly. She causes most of my trouble. I rub the back of my neck with my hand, knowing I'm full of shit. I wouldn't say that. His brown eyes narrow, and his fingers play with the top button of his vest. Both of us sit in silence for a beat, unsure what to say. I have so much guilt, Harden. If you hadn't made it through high school and gone to college, I don't know what I would have done. Nothing, you would have been living your perfect life here, I snap. He flinches as if I've slapped him. That's not true. I only want the best for you. I didn't always show it, and I know that, but your future is very important to me. Is that why you had me accepted into WCU in the first place? We've never discussed the fact that I know he used his position to get me into this damn school. I know he did. I didn't do shit in high school, and my transcripts prove it. That, and the fact that your mother was at her breaking point with you. I wanted you to come here so I could get to know you. You aren't the same boy you were when I left. If you wanted to know me, you should have stuck around longer. And drunk less. Fragments of memories that I've tried so hard to forget push their way into my mind. You left, and I never had the chance to just be a boy. I used to occasionally wonder how it felt to be a happy child with a strong and loving family. While my mum worked from sunup to sundown, I would sit in the living room alone, just staring at the dingy and slanted walls for hours. I would make myself some shitty meal that was barely edible, and imagine that I was sitting at a table full of people who loved me. They would laugh and ask how my day went. When I'd get into a fight at school, I'd sometimes wish I had a father around to either pat me on the back or bust my ass for starting trouble. Things got much easier for me as I grew up. Once I was a teenager and I realized I could hurt people, everything was easier. I could get back at my mum for leaving me alone while she worked by calling her by her first name and denying her the simple joy of hearing her only child say I love you. I could get back at my father by not speaking to him. I had one goal, to make everyone around me as miserable as I felt. That way, I would finally fit in. I used sex and lies to hurt girls and made a game of it. That backfired when my mum's friends spent too much time around me. Her marriage was ruined, along with her dignity, and my mum was heartbroken that her 14-year-old son had done such a thing. Ken looks like he catches on, as if he knows exactly what I'm thinking. I know that, and I'm sorry for all the things you were subjected to because of me. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I push the chair back and stand up. My father stays seated, and I can't help the thrill of power that I get from standing over him this way. I feel so above him in every way possible. He's haunted by his guilt and regrets, and I'm finally coming to terms with mine. So much happened that you wouldn't understand. I wish I could tell you, but it wouldn't change anything. I said I don't want to talk about it anymore. I've already had a shitty day, and this is too much. I get it. You regret leaving us, and all that shit. I'm over it, I lie, and he nods. It's not a full-on lie, really. I'm much closer to being over it than I've ever been before. When I reach the door, a thought pops into my mind, and I turn around to face him. My mum's getting married. Did you know that? I ask out of curiosity. From his blank stare and the way his brows lower, it's clear that he had no fucking clue. To Mike you know, the neighbor guy? Oh. He frowns. In two weeks. That soon? Yeah. I nod. Is that a problem or something? No, not at all. I'm just a little surprised, that's all. Yeah, me too. I lean my shoulder against the doorframe and watch as my father's expression transforms from sullen to relieved. Will you be attending? No. Ken Scott rises to his feet and walks around his massive desk to stand in front of me. I have to admit, I'm slightly intimidated. Not by him, 
of course, but by the raw emotion in his eyes when he says, you have to go, Harden. It will break her heart if you don't. Especially because she knows that you attended my wedding to Karen. Yeah, well, we both know why I attended yours. I didn't have a choice, and your wedding wasn't halfway across the damn planet. It might as well have been, given how we never really talked. You have to go. Tessa knows about it? Fuck. I hadn't considered this. No, and you don't need to tell her either. Or Landon. He won't keep his mouth shut if he knows. Is there a reason that you're hiding it from her? He asks, judgment filling his voice. It's not that I'm hiding it. I just don't want her to worry about going. She doesn't even have a passport. She's never even left the state of Washington. You know she'll want to go. Tessa loves England. She's never even been there. I raise my voice and take a deep breath in an attempt to calm myself down. It drives me insane the way he acts as if she's his own daughter, as if he knows her better than I do. I won't say anything, he says, raising his hand slightly, as if to placate me. I'm glad he doesn't press the topic. I've done enough talking already, and I'm fucking exhausted. I got absolutely no sleep last night, after I got off of the phone with Tessa. My nightmares came back full fucking force, and I made myself stay awake, after I woke up dry heaving for the third time. You should go by, and see Karen soon. She was asking about you last night, he says just before I walk out of his office. Um, yeah, I mumble and close the door behind me. Chapter 109. Tessa. In class, the guy I've determined is a future politician leans over and whispers to me, who did you vote for in the election? I feel slightly uncomfortable around my new classmate. He's charming, too charming, and his dressy clothes and brown skin make for a very distracting sight. He's not attractive in the same way that Hardin is, but he's certainly attractive, and he knows it. I didn't, I reply. I wasn't old enough to vote. He laughs. Right. I didn't really want to talk with him, but in the last few minutes of class our professor instructed us to talk among ourselves, while he took a phone call. I'm relieved when the clock strikes 10, and it's time to go. The future politician's attempt to continue making small talk with me as we exit the classroom fails miserably, and after a few seconds he dismisses himself and walks the other way. I've been distracted all morning. I haven't been able to stop thinking about what Staff must have said to Hardin, to get him so worked up. I know he believed me about the rumors about Zed, but whatever else it was that she said to him bothered him enough that he didn't want to repeat it. I hate Steph. I hate her for what she did to me and for getting into Hardin's head and hurting him by using me, in a way. By the time I make it to my art history class, I've planned 10 different scenarios of how to murder that horrible girl in my mind. I sit next to Michael, the blue-haired boy from the first class with a good sense of humor, and spend the entire hour of art history laughing at his jokes, which is a good distraction from my homicidal thoughts. At last the day's over, and I'm heading to my car. Right as I reach it and start to climb in, my phone starts vibrating. I expect it to be hardened, but looking down, I see it's not. I have three text messages, two of which just showed up. I decide to read my mother's first, call me. We need to talk. Next is Zed's. I take a deep breath before pressing the small envelope shaped button. I'll be in Seattle Thursday sat. Let me know when you're free I rub my temples, grateful that I saved Kimberly's message for last. Nothing she has to say could possibly be as stressful as telling Zed that I take back my offer of seeing him or having a conversation with my mother. Did you know Loverboy is going to London next weekend? I spoke too soon. England? Why would Hardin be going to England? Is he moving there after he graduates? I reread her text message next weekend. I rest my forehead against the steering wheel of my car and close my eyes. My first instinct is to call him and ask him why he's hiding the trip from me. I stop myself from doing that because this is the perfect opportunity for me to try not to jump to conclusions without asking him first. There is a chance, a small one, that Kimberly is mistaken and Hardin isn't going to England next weekend. My chest tightens at the thought of him still wanting to move back there. I'm still trying to convince myself that I'll be enough to keep him here. 
Chapter 110. Harden. It feels like ages since I've been at this place. I've been driving around for the last hour, going over the possible outcomes of my coming here. After formulating a mental list of pros and cons, something I never, ever do, I shut my car off and step into the cold afternoon air. I'm assuming he's home. If not, I just wasted my entire afternoon, and I'll be even more irritated than I already am. I glance around the parking lot and find his truck near the front. The brown apartment building is set just off of the street, and a rusty staircase leads up to the second floor, where his place is. With each stomp of my boot against the metal staircase, I run through the reasons why I'm here in the first place. Just as I reach apartment C, my phone vibrates in my back pocket. It's either Tessa or my mom, neither of whom I want to speak with right now. If I talk to Tessa, I'll be thrown off my plan. And my mom will just annoy me with her wedding talk. I knock on the door. Within second set answers, wearing only drawstring pants. His feet are bare, and I notice the intricate clockwork and gear tattoo that he showed me before has spread further across his stomach. He must have gotten more of it done after he tried to get with my fucking girl. Zed doesn't greet me. Instead, he just stares at me from the doorway, a look of obvious shock and suspicion on his face. We need to talk, I finally say, and push past him to enter his apartment. Should I call the cops, he asks in that dry tone he gets. I take a seat on his worn leather couch and stare up at him. That depends on whether you cooperate or not. Dark hair covers his jawline and frames his mouth. It feels like months have passed since I saw him outside Tessa's mum's house instead of only 10 or so days. He sighs and leans his back against the wall on the opposite side of his small living room. Well, get to it, then. Do you know this is about Tessa? I figured as much. He frowns and crosses his tattooed arms. You aren't going to Seattle. He raises a thick brow before he smiles. I am, though. I've already made the plans. What the fuck? Why would he be going to Seattle? He's making this much harder than it needs to be, and I'm beginning to kick myself in the ass for thinking this conversation would end in any way except him leaving on a stretcher. The thing is I breathe in a deep breath to keep myself calm and stick to the plan. You are going to Seattle. I'm visiting my friends there, he answers, challenging me. Bullshit. I know exactly what you're doing, I bite back. I'm staying with some friends in Seattle, but in case you were wondering, she did invite me to visit her. The moment the words leave his mouth, I'm on my feet. Don't push me, I'm trying to do this the right way. You have no reason to visit her. She's mine. He raises one brow. Do you realize how that sounds? Saying she's yours like she's your property? I don't give a fuck how it sounds. It's true. I take another step toward him. The air between us has shifted from tense to downright primal. Both of us are trying to stake a claim here, and I'm not backing down. If she's yours, then why aren't you in Seattle with her, he presses. I'm graduating after the semester, that's why. Why am I even answering his questions? I came here to talk, not to listen and engage in dialogue, as a professor of mine used to say. I'll be damned if he tries to turn this shit on me. Me not being there is irrelevant. You won't be seeing her while you're there. That's for her to decide, don't you think? If I thought that, I wouldn't be here, would I? My fists tighten at my sides, and I look away from him to stare at the stack of science textbooks on his coffee table. Why won't you just leave her alone? Is this because of what I did too? No, he interrupts smoothly. It has nothing to do with that. I care about Tessa, just like you. But unlike you, I treat her the way she deserves to be treated. You know nothing about how I treat her, I growl. Yeah, man, I actually do. How many times has she run to me crying because of something you did or said? Too many. He points a finger at me. All you do is hurt her, and you know it. You don't even know her, first of all, and secondly, don't you think it's a little pathetic of you to keep pining after someone you'll never have? How many times have we had this conversation, about how many girls? He eyes me carefully, taking in my anger, but not really biting on my pointing out his history with girls. No his tongue darts out to wet his lips it's not pathetic. 
It's genius, actually. With Tessa, I'll be waiting in the background for the day when you fuck up again, which is inevitable, and when you do, I'll be there for her. You are fucking, I step back across the room to put as much space between his body and mine before his head ends up going through his wall. What will it take, then? Do you want her to tell you herself that she doesn't want you around? I thought she already did that, yet here you are you're the one in my apartment. God damn it, said. I shout. Why can't you just fucking stop? You know what she means to me, and you're always trying to get in the way. Find someone else to toy with. There are plenty of whores around campus. Whores? He repeats the word, mocking me. Do you know I didn't mean Tessa, I growl, struggling to keep my fists at my sides. If she meant so much to you, you wouldn't have done half the shit you did. Does she know that you fucked Molly while you were chasing her around? Yes, she knows that. I told her. And she didn't mind? His voice is the complete opposite of mine. He's so collected and calm while I'm struggling mightily to keep the lid on my boiling anger. She knows that it meant nothing to me and that it was before everything. I glare at him, trying to focus again. But I didn't come here to discuss my relationship. Okay, why, exactly, did you come, then? He's such a smug bastard. To let you know that you aren't going to see her in Seattle. I thought we could discuss it in a more, I search for the right. Words, civilized manner. Civilized? Sorry, but I find it hard to believe that you came here with enlightened intentions, he scoffs, pointing to the bump on the bridge of his nose. I close my eyes momentarily and envision his nose busted and bleeding, snapping under the metal casing when I slammed his head against it. The memory of the sound heightens my already buzzing adrenaline. This is civilized for me. I came here to talk, not to fight, however, if you won't stay away from her, I don't have any other options. I widen my stance a little. Then what? Zed asks. What? Then what? We've been down this road before. There are only so many times that you can assault me before you get yourself arrested. And this time I will follow through on pressing charges. He makes a valid point. Which only makes me matter. I hate the fact that I can't do a fucking thing about it, except literally murder him which isn't an option at this point at least. I take a couple of breaths and try to relax my muscles. I have to offer my last option. One that I didn't want to have to rely on, but he's not giving me much room here. I came here thinking we could come to some sort of agreement, I say. He tilts his head to the side in the cockiest way possible. What type of agreement? Is it another bet? You're really pushing me, I say through my teeth. Tell me what it'll take for you to leave her alone. What can I give you to make you go away? Name it, and it's yours. Zed stares at me, blinking rapidly, as if I've grown another head. Well, come on, now. Every man has a price, I murmur dryly. It infuriates me that I have to negotiate with someone like him, but there's nothing else I can do to make him go away. Let her see me again, one more time, he suggests. I'll be in Seattle on Thursday. No. Absolutely not. Is he fucking stupid? I'm not asking your permission here. I'm trying to make you feel more comfortable with it. It's not happening. You two have no reason to spend time together. She isn't available to you, or any other man, and she never will be. There you go, getting all possessive. He rolls his eyes, and I wonder what Tessa would say if she could see this side of him, the only side I've ever known. What would I be as her man? if I weren't possessive, if I was okay sharing her with someone. I bite my tongue, while Zed stares at the ceiling, as if he's deliberating his next words. This is such fucking bullshit, pure and utter fucking bullshit. My head is spinning, and I'm honestly beginning to wonder just how much longer I can keep my cool. Finally, Zed looks at me, a smirk slowly overtaking his features. Then he says simply, your car. My mouth falls open at his audacity, and I can't help but laugh. No fucking way. I take two steps toward him. I'm not giving you my fucking car. Are you out of your fucking mind? My hands fly into the air. Sorry, then. Looks like we can't come to an agreement after all. His eyes glitter through their thick lashes, and he rubs his fingers over his beard. 
images from my nightmare flowed through my head, him thrusting into her, making her come I shake my head, to get rid of them. Then I dig my keys out of my pocket, and toss them onto the coffee table between us. He gapes, bending down to retrieve the keychain. You're serious? He steadies the keys, turning them over in his palm a few times, before looking back up at me. I was fucking with you. He tosses me the keys, but I don't catch them in time. They land only inches from the toe of my boot. I'll back off fuck. I didn't expect you to actually give me your keys. He laughs, mocking me. I'm not as big an asshole as you. I glower at him. You weren't giving me many options. We were friends once, remember? Said remarks. I stay silent as we both remember how everything used to be, before all of this shit, before I actually gave a fuck about anything before her. His eyes have shifted, his shoulders have tensed along with the air after his question. It's hard to recall those supposed days. I was too shit-faced to remember. You know that isn't true, he exclaims, raising his voice. You stopped drinking after, I didn't come here to take a walk down memory lane with you. Are you going to back off or not? I look at him. He's different somehow, harder. He shrugs. Sure, yeah. But that was too easy I'm serious. So am I, he says with a wave of his hand at me. This means absolutely no contact with her. None, I remind him again. She's going to wonder why. I texted her earlier today. I choose to ignore this. Tell her you don't want to be friends with her anymore. I don't want to hurt her feelings like that, he says. I don't give a fuck about hurting her feelings. You need to make it clear that you aren't going to be pining after her anymore. The momentary calm I felt has ceased, and my temper is rising again. The possibility that Tess's feelings would somehow be hurt by said not wanting to be friends with her drives me fucking crazy. I walk toward the door, knowing myself well enough that I won't make it another five minutes in this musty apartment. I'm pretty damn proud of myself for remaining peaceful this long in a room with said after all the shit he's done to interfere with my relationship. As my hand touches the rusted doorknob, he says, I'll do what I have to do for now, but it still isn't going to change the outcome of all this. You're right. It won't. I agree with him, knowing that he means the exact opposite of what I do. Before his fucking mouth can utter another word, I get out of his apartment and walk down the staircase as quickly as possible. By the time I pull into my father's driveway, the sun is setting, and I still haven't been able to reach Tessa, each call going straight to voicemail. I've even called Christian twice, but he's yet to answer or return my calls. Tessa's going to be mad that I went to Zed's apartment. She feels something for him that I'm never going to understand or tolerate. After today, I pray that I won't have to worry about him any longer. Unless she clings to him, no. I stop myself from doubting her. I know Steph was feeding me bullshit, and it seeped into every insecure crack in my stone facade. If Zed had actually fucked Tessa, he'd have used this afternoon as the perfect opportunity to throw it in my face. I walk into my father's house without knocking, and search the downstairs for Karen or Landon. Karen is in the kitchen, standing over the stove with a wire whisk in her hand. She turns and greets me with a warm smile, but also with troubled, tired eyes. An unfamiliar feeling of guilt spreads through me as I remember the planter I accidentally broke in her greenhouse. Hi Hardin. Are you looking for Landon? She asks, placing the whisk on a plate and wiping her hands on the bottom of her strawberry print apron. I, I don't know, really, I admit. What am I doing here? How pathetic is my life right now, that I find comfort in coming to this house, of all places. I know it's because of the memories, that were created when I was here with Tessa. He's upstairs, on the phone with Dakota. Something about Karen's tone throws me off. Is I'm not very good at interacting with people besides Tessa, and I'm particularly bad at dealing with other people's emotions. Is he having a bad day or something? I ask, sounding like a dumbass. I think so. He's having a hard time, I think. He hasn't spoken to me about anything, but he seems upset lately. Yeah I say, but I haven't noticed anything different. About my stepbrother's mood. Then again, I've been too busy forcing him to babysit Richard to notice. When does he leave for New York again? Three weeks. 
She tries to hide the pain in her voice that comes along with the words but fails miserably. Oh. I'm growing more and more uncomfortable by the minute. Well, I'm going to go, don't you want to stay for dinner, she asks eagerly. Uh, no. I'm okay. Between the talk with my father this morning, the time I spent with said, and now this awkward shit with Karen, I'm on overload. I can't take the chance that something is actually wrong with Landon. I won't be able to deal with him being all emotional and shit, not today. I already have to go home to a recovering drug addict in an empty fucking bed. Chapter 111. Tessa. Kimberly is waiting in the kitchen for me when I arrive home from school. Two winoglasses, one full, one empty, sit in front of her, letting me know that she took my silence as confirmation that I, in fact, didn't know about Hardin's plan to fly to England. She offers me a sympathetic smile when I drop my bag on the floor and sit on the stool next to her. Hey, girl. I swing my head dramatically to face her. Hey. You didn't know? Her blonde hair is expertly curled today, resting perfectly on her shoulders. Her black, bow-shaped earrings glitter under the bright lighting. Nope. Didn't tell me. I sigh, reaching for the full glass of wine in front of her. She laughs and grabs the bottle to fill the empty glass that was originally intended for me. Christian said Hardin hasn't given Trish a definite answer yet. I shouldn't have said anything until I knew, but I had a feeling he wouldn't have mentioned the wedding to you. I quickly swallow the white wine in my mouth before I spit it out. Wedding? I hurry to take another sip before I have to speak again. A wild thought shoots through me that Hardin's going back to get married. Like an arranged marriage. They do those in England, don't they? No, I know they don't. But the horrible thought electrifies me while I wait for Kimberly's next words. Am I drunk already? His mom's getting married. She called Christian this morning to invite us. I quickly look down at the dark granite. That's news to me. Hardin's mother is getting married in two weeks, yet he didn't mention it to me at all. Then I remember when he was being weird earlier. That's why she was calling so much. Kimberly looks at me with wide, questioning eyes as she takes a sip of her wine. What should I do? I ask her. Just pretend that I don't know? Hardin and I have been communicating, so much better lately I trail off. I know that it's only been a week of improvement, but it's been one amazing week for me. I feel like we've made more progress in the last seven or so days than we have in the last seven months. Hardin and I both have been talking through issues that previously would have turned into massive fights, yet here I am being transported back in time to when he kept things from me. I always find out. Doesn't he know this by now? Do you want to go? She asks. I couldn't, even if I were invited. I rest my cheek against my hand. Kimberly moves her stool to the side and grips the edges of mine to turn it to face her. I ask if you want to go, she corrects me, a hint of wine on her breath. It would be lovely, but I, then you should go. I'll bring you as a guest, if I have to. I'm sure Hardin's mom would love you there. Christian says she absolutely adores you. Despite my mood over Hardin's secrecy, her words thrill me. I absolutely adore Trish. I can't go, I don't have a passport, I say. And I could never afford a plane ticket on such short notice. She waves off my objection. Those can be expedited. I don't know I say. The butterflies I'm feeling in my belly at the mention of England make me want to rush down the hall to my computer and research how to get a passport, but the unwelcome knowledge of Hardin's purposely keeping the wedding from me forces me to stay in my seat. Don't doubt it. Trish would love to have you come along, and Lord knows Hardin could use a push toward commitment. She sips on her wine, leaving a deep red print of her full lips on the rim of the glass. I'm sure he has his reasons for not telling me. If he's going, he probably doesn't want me to tag along all the way to England. I know his past haunts him, and crazy as it sounds, his demons could easily be stalking the streets of London and find us both. Hardin doesn't work that way I say. The more I push, the harder he pulls. Well then she moves her red toed high heel and gently taps her foot against mine. You need to dig your heels in the damn dirt and not let him pull you anymore. I seize on her words and save them to analyze later when I'm not under her watchful gaze. 
Harden doesn't like weddings. Everyone likes weddings. Not Harden. He thoroughly hates them, and the entire concept of marriage, I tell her, and watch with a peculiar amusement as her eyes widen, and she carefully places her winnagless back onto the countertop. So then, what I mean she blinks. I don't even have anything to say, and that's really saying something. Kimberly bursts out laughing. I can't help but laugh along. Yeah, tell me about it. Kimberly's laugh is contagious, regardless of my mood, and I love that about her. Certainly, she can be excessively nosy at times, and I don't always feel comfortable with the way she speaks about Hardin, but her openness and honesty happen to be the things I love the most about her. She tells it like it is, and she's very easy to read. There's not a layer of guile there, unlike so many people I've met of late. So you what? Just date forever, she asks. I said the same thing. I can't help but giggle. Maybe it's the glass of wine I finished, or the fact that Hardin's refusal of any type of permanent commitment had slipped my mind in the last week I don't know, but it feels good to laugh with Kim. What about your children? You don't mind having them out of wedlock? Children. I laugh again. He doesn't want any children. This just keeps getting better and better. She rolls her eyes and picks up her glass to finish it off. He says that now, but I'm hoping I don't finish the wish. It's too desperate sounding when said out loud. Kimberly winks. Ah, gotcha, she says knowingly, and I'm thankful when she changes the subject to this redeed in the office, carrying, who is a crush on Trevor. And when she describes a hypothetical sexual encounter between the two of them as being like watching lobsters awkwardly bumping into each other, I start laughing all over again. By the time I get to my room, it's past 9 o'clock. I purposely powered off my cell phone so that I could have a few uninterrupted hours with Kimberly. I told her about Hardin's plan to come to Seattle on Wednesday instead of Friday, and she laughed, telling me she knew he wouldn't stay gone long. My hair is still damp from a shower, and I've been taking my time picking out my outfit for work tomorrow. I'm stalling, and I know it. I'm sure that when I turn on my phone, I'll have to deal with Hardin, and confront him, or not, about the wedding. In a perfect world, i just casually bring it up, and Hardin would invite me, explaining that he waited to ask, because he was trying to think of the right way, to convince me to come. But this isn't a perfect world, and I'm growing more anxious by the second. It hurts me to know that, whatever Steph said to him bothered him. So much that he's back to keeping things from me. I hate her. I love Hardin so much and I just want him to see that nothing she, or anyone else, says will ever change that. Hesitantly, I take my phone out of my bag and power it back on. I have to call my mother back and text Zed, but I want to talk to Hardin first. The notifications on the top of my small screen appear, and the envelope icon flashes, text message after text message appearing, all from Hardin. Before I read any of them, I just call. He answers on the first ring. Tessa, what the hell? Have you tried to call? I ask timidly, as innocently as I can, trying to keep the mood as calm as possible. Have I tried to call? You're joking, right? I've been calling you nonstop for the last three hours, he huffs. I even called Christian. What? I say, but then, not wanting things to escalate, I follow up quickly with I was just hanging out with Kim. Where, he immediately demands. Here, at the house, I say and begin to fold my dirty clothes and place them in the hamper. I figure I'll do a load of laundry before I go to bed. Well, next time you really need he lets out a groan of frustration and his voice softens as he begins again. Maybe next time you could just send me a text or something if you're going to have your phone off. He releases a big breath, then adds, you know how I get. I appreciate the change in his tone and the fact that he stopped himself from saying whatever it was he had originally planned to say, which I'd rather not find out. Unfortunately, the small buzz I got from the wine has mostly disappeared, and the revelation of Hardin's plans to go to England rests heavily on my chest. How was your day today? I ask him, hoping that if I give him an opportunity to bring the wedding up, he will. He sighs. It was well, long. Mine too. I don't know what to say to him without coming out and asking point blank. Zed texted me today. 
Did he? Hardin's voice is calm, but I can detect a note of harshness that would usually intimidate me. Yeah, this afternoon. He says he's coming to Seattle on Thursday. And what did you say back to him? Nothing yet. Why are you telling me this? Hardin asks. Because, I want us to be open with one another. No more secrets, no more hiding things. I emphasize the last part of the sentence, hoping it will elicit the truth from him. Well thanks for telling me. I appreciate it, he says. And then says nothing more. Seriously? Yeah, so is there anything you want to tell me? I ask, still clinging to the dwindling hope that he'll reciprocate my honesty. Um, I talked to my dad today. Really? About what? Thank goodness, I knew he would come around. Transferring to the Seattle campus. Really? The word comes out sounding more like a squeal than I intended, and Hardin's deep laugh resonates through the line. Yeah, but he says it will postpone my graduation, so it wouldn't make sense to move this late in the semester. Oh. I feel myself pouting. I hesitate a moment before asking, but after graduation? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure? That's it? That easy? The smile that overcomes me crowds out everything else. I wish you were here. I grab him by his t-shirt and kiss him, hard. Then he says, I mean, why stall the inevitable? My smile fades. You're speaking like moving to Seattle is a jail sentence. He stays quiet. Harden? I don't think of it like that. I'm just annoyed by the whole thing, all this time has been wasted, and it frustrates me. I get that, I say. His words aren't elegant, but they mean he's missing me. My head is still spinning from his agreeing to finally move to Seattle to be with me. We've been battling over this issue for months, and he's suddenly given in without so much as a final fight. So, Seattle it is, then? Are you sure? I have to ask again. Yeah. I'm ready to start fresh somewhere, may as well be Seattle. I hug my arms around my body in excitement. No England, then? I give him one last chance to bring up the wedding. Nope. No England. I've already won the great battle of Seattle, so when the niggling irritation about the wedding flares up again, I don't push my guy any further tonight. Whatever's going on with that, I'm going to get what I want. Hardin in Seattle, with me. Chapter 112. Tessa. When my alarm sounds the next morning, I'm exhausted. I barely slept at all. I spent hours tossing and turning, always on the brink of sleep, but never achieving it. I don't know if it was the excitement over Hardin agreeing to move to Seattle, or if it was the looming discussion we're bound to have about England, but either way, I got no sleep, and now I look like hell. Dark shadows aren't as easy to hide with concealer as the cosmetics companies would have you believe, and my unruly hair looks as if I stuck my finger into a light socket. Apparently the joy I felt about him moving here couldn't completely eliminate the underlying anxiety about his lying by omission. I take Kimberly up on her offer to ride to work together this morning, buying myself a few extra minutes to apply another coat of mascara, while she recklessly whips in and out of lanes on the freeway. She reminds me of Hardin, cursing at nearly every car and honking more often than any reasonable person needs to do. Hardin hasn't mentioned whether or not he's still planning on coming to Seattle today. When I asked him, just before we got off the phone last night, he told me he'd let me know in the morning. It's close to nine now, and I haven't heard from him. I can't shake the feeling that something is happening within him, something that if not handled properly will cause us more turmoil. I know Steph got to him. I can tell by the way he's doubting everything I say. He's keeping things from me again, and I'm terrified of the problems this could lead to. Maybe you should go back this weekend instead of having him coming to you, Kimberly suggests between cursing out a semi and a mini. It's that obvious? I ask, lifting my cheek from the cold window. Yes, very obvious. Sorry, I'm being such a downer. I sigh. Going back this weekend isn't a bad idea. I miss Landon terribly, and it would be nice to see my father again. You are. She grins at me. But that's nothing a little coffee, and some red lipstick won't fix. When I nod my agreement, she quickly exits the highway, makes a U-turn in the middle of a busy intersection, and says, 
I know a great little coffee shop nearby. By lunchtime, my morning blues have disappeared, although I still haven't heard from Hardin. I texted him twice but ultimately stopped myself from calling him. Trevor is waiting for me at an empty table in the break room, two plates of pasta in front of him. They send double my order, so I figured I'd save you from a microwave meal for at least one day. He smiles, sliding a packet of plastic eating utensils across the table. The pasta tastes as savory as it smells. The delicious Alfredo sauce reminds me that I skipped breakfast this morning, and I flush when a small moan falls from my mouth as I take my first bite. Good, huh? Trevor beams, wiping his thumb across the corner of his mouth to capture a drop of the creamy sauce. He brings his thumb to his mouth, and I can't help but think how odd the causal gesture looks on a man who's wearing a suit. MMM I can barely answer, because I'm too busy shoving noodles in my face. I'm glad Trevor's deep blue eyes dart away from mine, and he shifts in his seat. Is everything all right? I ask him. Yeah I will I wanted to talk to you about something. And like that, I begin to ask myself if the double meal wasn't in fact purposely ordered. Okay I respond, hoping this isn't going to be too awkward. It may be a little awkward. Great. Go on, I say with an encouraging smile. Okay here goes. He pauses and runs his fingertip over a silver cuff link. Karin has asked me to attend Crystal's wedding with her. I take the opportunity to shovel a forkful of pasta into my mouth so I don't have to speak just yet. Really, I'm not sure why he's telling me this or what I'm supposed to say. I nod, pushing him to continue and try not to laugh thinking the funny Karin imitation Kimberly was doing yesterday. And I was wondering if there was any reason that I should say no to her, Travers says. He pauses to look at me like he expects a response. I'm positive that the choking sound I make frightens him, but when he shoots me a look of concern, I hold up one finger and continue chewing, thoroughly, then swallow rather dramatically before responding. I don't see any reason for it. I hope that's the end of that. But when he goes on to say what I mean, is all I can hope, is that he magically guesses that I, in fact, know exactly what he means, and will just sort of let that sentence trail off without further explanation. No such luck. I know you're on and off with Hardin, and I also know this is one of those off times, so I just wanted to be sure, before I accept her proposal, that I can give her my full affection. Without distractions. I'm not sure what to say, so I quietly ask, am I a distraction? I feel so uncomfortable, but Trevor is so sweet, and his cheeks have turned such a deep shade of red, that I feel an overwhelming urge to comfort him at the same time. Yes, you have been since you came to Vance, he says, rushing the words out. I don't mean that in a bad way, it's just that I've been waiting in the background, and I wanted my intentions to be clear before I explored the possibility of a relationship with someone else. My very own Mr. Colin sits in front of me, a much more handsome version, of course, and I feel just as awkward and embarrassed for him as Elizabeth Bennet did in Pride and Prejudice. Trevor, I'm sorry I, it's okay, really. The sincerity in his eyes is almost overwhelming. I get it. I just wanted to confirm it one last time. He pokes at his pasta a little, then adds, I guess the last few times hadn't done it for me. He laughs quietly, a nervous laugh, and I join in sympathetically. She's lucky to have you as a day to the wedding, I say, hoping to numb the embarrassment I know he feels. I shouldn't have compared him to Mr. Collins, he's not nearly as aggressive or obnoxious. I take a long drink of water, hoping that will end things. Thank you, he says, but then he adds with a little smile, maybe now Hardin will stop calling me fucking Trevor. I smack my hand against my mouth to stop the water from spewing from my mouth. I swallow quickly, then say, I didn't know you knew about that. My horrified laugh fills the small room. Yeah, I've noticed. Trevor's eyes shine with humor, and I'm so relieved that we can share a laugh, as friends, would know. Confusion. My momentary bliss is cut short when Trevor's smile disappears, and I turn around to follow his gaze to the doorway. It smells so good in here, one of the gossips, says to the other as he enters. I feel petty for the level of dislike I feel for them, but I can't help it. 
We should go, Trevor whispers, eyeing the shorter woman. I stare back at him, puzzled, but get to my feet and toss the empty styrofoam box into the trash can. You look stunning today, Tessa, the taller of the two, says. I can't read her expression, but I'm positive that she's mocking me. I know I look like hell today. Um, thank you. It's such a small world, you know? Is Hardin still working for Bolt House? My purse slips off of my shoulder, and I quickly grab a leather strap before it hits the floor. She knows Hardin? Yup, still is, I say and straighten my back in an attempt to appear completely unfazed at the mention of his name. Tell him I said hey, would you? She smirks, and with that, she turns on her heel and disappears, along with her evil sidekick. What the hell was that? I ask Trevor, after checking the hall, to be sure the two aren't lurking around nearby. Did you know they were going to say something to me? I wasn't sure, but I suspected it. I overheard them talking about you. What about me? They don't even know me. He's uncomfortable again. Trevor is easier to read than anyone I've ever met. It wasn't about you, exactly they were talking about Hardin, weren't they? I ask and he nods, confirming my suspicion. What exactly did they say? Trevor tucks the corners of his bright red tie into his suit. I, I don't really want to repeat it. You should ask him. Given Trevor's reluctance, I suddenly shiver at the thought that Hardin may have slept with one of them, or both. They aren't much older than I am, 25 at the most, and, I have to admit, both beautiful, in an over-the-top, too much spray tan way, but attractive all the same. The walk back to my office is long, and a strong feeling of jealousy starts gnawing at me. If I don't ask Hardin about the woman, I think I'll go insane. The moment I get to my office, I call him. I need to know if he's coming here tonight, and I need some reassurance. Zed's name flashes across my phone screen before I can bring up Hardin's name in my contacts list. I flinch a little, but decide I might as well do this now. Hey, I say. But I sound off, too excited, too fake. Hey, Tessa, how's it going? Zed asks. It feels like it's been so long since I've heard his smooth voice, even though that isn't the case. It's going. I lay my forehead against the cool surface of my desk. Sounds rough. It's okay, just a lot going on. Well, that's why I called you, actually. I know I said I was going to be in town Thursday, but I've had a change of plans. Oh, Relief washes over me. I look up at the ceiling and let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding. Well, it's okay. Next time it'll work, no, I mean I'm actually in Seattle right now, he says, and instantly my heart rate skyrockets. I got in last night, had a hell of a drive. I'm only a few blocks away from your office, actually. I won't bother you there or anything, but maybe we could grab some dinner or something when you're done for the day. Oh my glance at the clock. It's 15 minutes past 2, and Hardin still hasn't responded to my messages. I don't know if that's good for me, actually. I think Hardin is coming in tonight, I admit. First Trevor, now Zed. Did the extra mascara this morning bring along some weird juju with it or something? Are you sure? Zed asks. I saw him out yesterday it was pretty late. What? Hardin and I got off the phone around 11 last night. Could he have gone out again after we got off the phone? Has he been spending time with his crew of so-called friends again? I don't know, I say and dramatically hit my head against my desk, too gently to do any damage, but hard enough that I know Zed can hear through the line. It's only dinner. Then I'll let you get to whatever plans you have, he coaxes. It'll be nice to see a familiar face, yeah? I can picture his smile now, the one that I adore so much. So I ask, I rode into work today with someone, so I don't have my car. Could you pick me up at five? And when he happily agrees, I'm both thrilled and terrified. Chapter 113. Tessa. Five minutes before five o'clock I try to call Hardin, but he doesn't pick up. Where has he been all day? Was Zed right when he said that Hardin was out late? It's possible that he's on his way to Seattle and is planning to surprise me, but really, what are the odds of that? My meeting with Zed has been weighing on my chest since the moment I agreed to it. 
I know Hardin hates our friendship. He hates it, so much that it haunts him in his dreams, and here I am, fueling that hatred. I don't bother to check my hair or touch up my makeup, before taking the elevator down to the lobby, studiously ignoring Kimberly's critical gaze. I probably shouldn't have informed her of my plans. Through the plate glass windows, Zed's truck is visible, and is a beautiful sight for me, and I can't ignore the excitement I feel to see a familiar face. I'd rather it be Hardin's, but Zed's here, and Hardin isn't. Zed climbs out of his truck to greet me, as soon as I step out of the building. His smile grows as I walk across the sidewalk, and I see that his face is now covered by dark hair. Dressed in black jeans and a gray long sleeve shirt, he looks as handsome as ever, and I look like death. Hey. He smiles, opening his arms for a hug. Uncertainty floods through me, but the need to be polite pushes me into his waiting arms. It's been a while, he says into my hair. I nod in agreement and ask, how was your drive, as I pull back from the embrace. He blows out a breath. Long. But I got to listen to some pretty good music on the way. He opens the passenger door for me, and I hurry to get inside and out of the cold air. The cab of his truck is warm and smells like him. What made you decide to come today instead of tomorrow? I ask to begin the conversation as Zed hesitantly pulls into traffic. It was just a change of mind, nothing, really. His eyes dart back and forth between the rear view and the side mirrors. Driving in the city is intimidating, I say to him. Yes. Very. He smiles, still focused on the road. Do you know where you want to grab dinner? I haven't done much exploring yet, so I don't know where the best spots are. I check my phone. Nothing from Hardin. So I pull up some restaurant options on an app, and after a couple minutes, Zed and I decide on a small Mongolian-style grill. I go with the chicken and vegetables and watch in as the chef prepares the food in front of us. I've never been to a place like this before, and Zed finds that amusing. We're seated in the very back of the small restaurant, Zed sitting across from me, and we're both too quiet for it to be comfortable. Is something wrong? I ask him, while picking up my food. Zed's eyes are soft and full of worry. I don't know, if I should even bring it up you seem like you've got so much going on already, and I want you to have a nice time. I'm fine. Tell me whatever it is that you need to. I brace myself for the unknown blow I'm sure is about to land. Hardin came to my place yesterday. What? I can't hide the surprise in my voice. Why would Hardin do that? And if he did, how's it that Zed is sitting here without any bruises or missing limbs? What did he want? I ask. To tell me to stay away from you, he promptly answers. When I mentioned Zed's text message to Hardin last night, he seemed so indifferent about the situation. What time? I ask, hoping it was after we talked about not keeping things from each other. Afternoon, around three. I let out an exasperated breath. Sometimes Hardin has no boundaries, and his list of offenses is growing by the second. I rub my temples, my appetite having disappeared. What did he say, exactly? That he didn't care how I did it, or if I hurt your feelings, just that I needed to stay away. He was being so calm, it was kinda freaky. He stabs his fork at a piece of broccoli, and pops it into his mouth. And you came here anyway? Yes, I did. The testosterone-fueled battle between the two of them is wearing me out, and I'm on the sidelines, trying to keep the peace but failing. Why? His golden eyes meet mine. Because his threats aren't going to work on me anymore. He can't tell me who to be friends with, which is something I hope you feel the same way about. I'm beyond irritated that Hardin went to Zed's apartment like that. I'm even more irritated that he didn't say anything to me about it and that he wanted Zed to hurt my feelings and end our friendship while keeping his role in the whole exchange hidden. I feel the same about Hardin controlling who I'm friends with. As the words leave my mouth, Zed's eyes fill with triumph, which also bothers me. But, I also think he has good reasons for not wanting us to be friends. Don't you? Zed shakes his head amicably. Yes and no. I won't hide my feelings for you, but you know that I don't push them onto you. I told you that I'll take what you can give me, and if friendship is all I can get, I'll live with it. I know you don't push. 
I choose to respond, only to half of his statement. Zed never pushes me to do anything, and he never tries to force me into anything, but I hate the way he talks about Hardin. Can you say the same for him? Zed challenges, looking at me intensely. The urge to defend Hardin makes me say, no. I can't. I know how he is, but that's just who he is. You're always so quick to defend him. I don't get it. You don't have to get it, I say harshly. Really? Zed says quietly and frowns. Yes. I straighten my back and sit up as tall as I can manage. It doesn't bother you how possessive he is? He tells you who you can be friends with it does bother me but you let him do it. Did you come all the way to Seattle to remind me that Hardin is controlling? Zed opens his mouth to speak but closes it. What? I push him. He has a claim on you and I'm worried about you. You seem so stressed out. I sign defeat. I am stressed, too stressed, but fighting with Zed isn't going to help anything. It's only intensifying my frustration. I'm not going to make excuses for him, but you don't know anything about our relationship. You don't see how he is with me. You don't understand him the way that I do. I push my plate away and notice that the couple at the next table over has turned their attention on us. Lowering my voice, I say, I don't want to fight with you, said. I'm exhausted, and I was really looking forward to spending this time with you. He leans back in his chair. I'm being such a jerk aren't I? He says with sad eyes. I'm sorry Tessa. I would blame the drive, but that's not an excuse. I'm sorry. It's okay, I didn't mean to snap at you. I don't know what's gotten into me. My period is due any day now, that must be why I'm so on edge. It's my fault, really. He reaches across the table and squeezes my hand. Tension still fills the air, and I can't stop thinking of Hardin, but I'd like to have a nice time, so I ask, how is everything else going? Zed dives into stories about his family and how warm Florida was the last time he visited. The conversation between us reverts to its normal, easy, meandering flow, and the tension evaporates, allowing me to finish my meal. After we're done eating and are heading to the exit, Zed asks, do you have more plans for the night? Yes, I'm going to Christian's Jazz Club. It just opened. Christian? Zed questions. Oh, my boss. That's who I'm staying with. His brow rises. You're staying with your boss? Yes, but he went to college with Hardin's father, and he's a longtime friend of Ken and Karen, I explain. It hasn't occurred to me that Zed doesn't know any of the details about my life. Although he picked me up after Christian's surprise engagement party for Kimberly, he doesn't know anything about them. Oh, so that's how you got a paid internship, then? Ouch. Yes. I admit. Well, it's awesome either way. Thanks. I stare out the window and pull my cell phone from my purse. Still nothing. What else do you plan on doing while you're in Seattle? I ask in the middle of trying to explain which roads to take to get us to Christian and Kimberly's house. I give up after a few minutes and type the address into my phone. The screen freezes, and the power shuts off twice before the device finally cooperates. I'm not sure. I'm going to see what my friends are up to. Maybe we could meet up again later tonight? Or before I leave on Saturday? That could be cool. I'll let you know, I say. When will Hardin be here? The venomous undertone to his question doesn't go unnoticed. I glance at my phone again, this time out of habit. I'm not sure, maybe tonight. Are you guys together right now? I know we said we wouldn't talk about it anymore, but I'm confused. So am I, I admit. We've been putting some space between us lately. Is that working? Yes. Until the last few days, when Hardin started to pull away from me. That's good, then. I have to know what thought is running through his mind. I can see it churning behind his eyes. What? Nothing. You don't want to hear it. Yes. I do. I know I'll regret it, but that doesn't stop my curiosity. I just don't see any space. You're in Seattle, staying with friends of his family, one of whom is also your boss. Even from miles away, he's controlling you, trying to end the few friendships that you have. And when he's not doing that, he's coming to Seattle to visit. 
That doesn't seem like much space to me. I haven't thought about my living arrangement from that perspective until now. Is that another reason why Harden sabotaged my getting an apartment? So that if I still decided to go to Seattle, I could be under the watchful eyes of his family's friends? I shake my head to escape the thought. It's working for us. I know it doesn't make sense to you, but it's working for us. I know, he tried to pay me off to stay away from you, said interjects. What? Yeah, he was threatening me, and he told me to make him an offer. He told me to find another whore on campuses to toy with. Whore? Said shrugs nonchalantly. He said that no one else will ever have you, and he was awfully proud of himself that you stuck around, even after he told you about sleeping with Molly after. The two of you started hanging out. The mention of Hardin and Molly Sting said knew it would. And that's exactly why he said it. We've already dealt with that. I don't want to talk about Hardin and Molly I say through gritted teeth. I just want you to know what you're dealing with. He's not the same person when you're not around. That's not a bad thing I retort, fighting back. You don't know him. I'm relieved when we pull onto the access road and into the outskirts of the city, signaling that we're less than five minutes away from Christian's place. The sooner this car ride is over, the better. You don't either, not really he says. You spend all of your time fighting with him. What's your goal here, said. I ask. I hate the direction our conversation has taken, but I don't know how to bring it back to neutral territory. Nothing. I just thought that after all this time, and all the shit he puts you through, you'd see the truth. A thought strikes me. Did you tell him you were coming here? No. You're not fighting fair here, I say, calling him out. Neither is he. He sighs, desperately trying to keep his voice down. Look, I know you'll defend him until you're blue in the face, but you can't blame me for wanting to have what he has. I want to be the one you're defending, I want to be the one that you trust, even though you shouldn't. I'm always there for you when he isn't. He rubs his hand over his facial hair and takes another breath. I'm not fighting fair, but neither is he. He hasn't from the beginning. Sometimes I swear the only reason he's so attached to you is because he knows that I have feelings for you too. This is exactly why said and I will never be able to have a friendship. Regardless of his sweetness and understanding, it will never work. He hasn't given up and I suppose there's honor in that. However, I can't give him what he wants from me, and I don't want to feel like I have to explain my relationship with Hardin every time I see him. He's been there for me, it's true, but only because I allowed him to be. I say, I don't know if I have enough left of me to give to you, even as a friend. Zed looks over at me with an even expression. That's because he's drained you. I stay silent and stare out the window at the pine trees lining the road. I don't like the tension I'm feeling right now, and I'm fighting back some tears, when I hear Zed mutter, I didn't want tonight, to end up this way. Now you'll probably never want to see me again. I point out the window. It's this driveway. An awkward intense silence fills the cab of the truck until the massive house comes into view. When I look over at him, Zed is staring wide-eyed at Christian's place. This is even bigger than the other house, the one I picked you up from before, he points out, trying to ease the tension. In an effort to do the same, I begin to tell him about the gym, the spacious kitchen, the way Christian can control what's going on in parts of the house with his iPhone. And then my heart leaps into my throat. Hardin's car is parked just behind Kimberly's sleek Audi. Zed spots it at the same time that I do, but he doesn't appear to be affected by it. I can feel the color draining from my face as I say, I better get inside. As we park, Zed says, again, I'm sorry Tessa. Please don't go inside upset with me. You have enough going on, I shouldn't have made you feel any worse. He offers to come inside, to be sure everything is okay, but I brush it off. I know Hardin will be pissed, beyond pissed, but I'm the one who created this mess, so I need to be held responsible for cleaning it up. It's okay, I reassure him with a fake smile and climb out of his truck with a promise to text him when I can. I'm aware of my slow strides as I walk to the door, but I don't make an effort to move faster. I'm trying to go over what I should say, whether or not I should be angry with Hardin, or apologize for seeing Zed again, 
when the door opens. Hardin steps out wearing his dark blue jeans and a plain black t-shirt. Despite the fact that it has only been two days since I last saw him, my pulse quickens and I ache to be closer to him. I've missed him so much in the few days that we've been apart. His face is set in stone and his icy gaze follows Zed's old truck as it disappears from view. Hardin, I, get inside, he scolds me. Don't tell, I begin. It's cold, come inside. Hardin's eyes are blazing, and the heat in them keeps me from arguing. He surprises me by gently resting his hand on the small of my back as he leads me inside the house, past where Kimberly and Smith are playing some card game in the living room, and into my bedroom without a word. Calmly, he closes the door behind him and turns the lock. Then he looks down at me, and my heart nearly bursts when he asks, why? Hardin, nothing happened, I swear. He said there was a change of plans, and I was so relieved, because I thought he wasn't coming, but instead he said that he'd arrived a day early and wanted to grab dinner. I shrug, partly to calm myself down. I didn't know how to say no. You never do, he spits, holding my gaze. I know you went to his apartment yesterday. Why didn't you tell me? Because you didn't need to know. His breathing is harsh, barely controlled. You don't get to decide what I need to know, I challenge him. You can't keep things from me. I know about your mother's wedding too. I blurt. I knew how you would react. He throws his hands up, trying to defend himself. I roll my eyes, stomping toward him. Bullshit. He doesn't even flinch. The veins in his arms are visible under the rare spots of white skin, soft blue laced with a black ink. His fists are tightly balled. One thing at a time. I will be friends with who I want to be friends with, and you won't keep going behind my back, acting like a child throwing a damn tempter tantrum, I warn him. You said you wouldn't go near him again. I know. I didn't get it before, but after spending time with him today, I made my own choice not to be friends with him. It's not because of you. I can see him flinch in surprise a little at that, but he maintains his dark intensity. Why's that? I look away, a little ashamed. Because I know he's a trigger for you, and I shouldn't keep pushing you by seeing him. I know how much it would hurt me, if you saw Molly or any other female, for that matter. That being said, you don't get to control my friendships, but I can't lie and say that I wouldn't feel the same way if I were you. He crosses his arms and breathes out roughly. Why now? What did he do to make you suddenly change your mind? Nothing. He didn't do anything to me. I just shouldn't have taken this long to get it. We have to be equals neither of us can hold the power. I can tell by the glow in his green eyes that he wants to say more, but instead he just nods. Come here. He opens his arms for me the way he always does, and I'm quick to wrap myself in them. How did you know that I was with him? I press my cheek against his chest. His minty scent invades my senses, pushing out all thoughts of said. Kimberly told me, he says into my hair. I frown. She really doesn't know how to keep her mouth shut. You weren't going to tell me? His thumb presses under my chin and lifts my head up. Yes, I was, but I'd rather have told you myself. I suppose that I'm grateful for Kimberly's honesty. It's hypocritical of me to only want her to be honest with me, and not with Hardin. Why didn't you come find us? I ask. I assumed if he knew that I was with said, that's exactly what he would have done. Because he breathes, staring into my eyes, you kept going on about the cycle, and I wanted to break it. My heart swells at his honest and thoughtful answer. He really is trying, and it means so much to me. I'm still mad, he adds. I know. I touch his cheek with my fingertips, and his arms tighten around me. I'm pissed, too. You didn't tell me about the wedding, and I want to know why. Not tonight, he warns. Yes, tonight. You got to say your piece about Zed, and now it's my turn. Tessa his lips compress into a hard line. Harding you're infuriating. He releases me and paces across the floor, putting a distance between us that I can't stand. So are you. I fire back, following his movements to get closer to him. I don't want to talk about the fucking wedding right now, I'm already livid, and barely controlling myself as it is. Don't push me, okay? Fine. 
I say loudly, but give in. Not because I'm afraid of what he'll say, but because I just spent two and a half hours with said, and I know Hardin's anger is only serving to mask the anxiety and pain I've caused him by doing so. Chapter 114. Tessa. I pull open my dresser drawer and dig out clean panties and a matching bra. I'm going to go shower. Kimberly wants to leave at 8, and it's already 7, I tell Hardin, who's sitting on the edge of my bed with his elbows resting on his knees. You're still going, he scoffs. Yes. I told you before, remember? That was the whole reason you wanted to come here, so I didn't have to go alone. That's not the only reason I came, he says defensively. I raise a speculative brow at him, and he rolls his eyes. I didn't say it's not a reason, but it's not the only one. You still want to come, right? I ask, dangling my underwear suggestively. This is rewarded with a slight smirk. No, I never wanted to come, but if you're going, so am I. I give him a wide smile, but when I leave the room, he doesn't follow. Which surprises me. I find myself kind of wishing he would this time. I don't know where we stand at the moment. I know he's pissed about said, and I'm upset that he's hiding things from me again, but overall I'm thrilled that he's here, and I don't want to waste our time fighting. I wrap a towel around my hair, since I don't have the time to wash and dry it before we leave. The hot water relieves some of the tension in my shoulders and back, but doesn't do much to clear my head. I need to work myself into a better mood within the hour. Hardin will be brooding all night, I'm sure. I want us to have a nice time out with Kimberly and Christian, I don't want any awkward silence or public fighting. I want us to get along, and I want to be in a happy mood, both of us. I haven't had a Seattle nightlife experience since I moved here, and I want my first to be as fun as possible. My guilt regarding Zed refuses to subside, but I'm relieved when my irritation and irrational thoughts slide down the drain along with the scalding water and suds of soap. The moment I shut off the shower, Hardin knocks at the door. I wrap a towel around myself and take a deep breath before answering. I'll be ready in 10 minutes. I need to try to do something with my hair, I say, and when I look into the mirror, there's Hardin standing behind me. He squints at the frizzy mess on my head. What's wrong with it now? It's out of control. I laugh. It won't take long. You're wearing that? He eyes the uncomfortable black dress, which is hanging on the shower curtain, since I was trying to to wrinkle it a bit. The last time I wore it, at the family vacation, it led to a disastrous night well, week. Yes, Kimberly said there's a dress code. What kind of dress code? Hardin looks down to his stained jeans and black t-shirt. I shrug and smile to myself, imagining Kimberly telling Hardin to change his outfit. I'm not changing, he tells me, and I shrug again. Hardin's eyes don't leave my reflection in the mirror the entire time that I put on my makeup and wrestle with a flat iron in my hair. The steam from the shower has made it curl in a terrible way. There's just no hope for it. I end up pulling it back into a low bun. At least my makeup actually looks really good. In even exchange for such a bad hair day. Are you staying until Sunday? I ask him as I put on my underwear and step into my dress. I want to make sure the tension between us is under control, and we don't spend the entire night arguing. Yes, why? Hardin coolly responds. I was thinking that instead of spending Friday here in Seattle, we could go back, and I could see Landon and Karen. Your father too. What about yours? Oh yeah I had momentarily forgotten about my father staying with Hardin. I've been trying really hard not to think about that situation until you can tell me more about it. I don't know if it's a good idea why not? I ask. I miss Landon so much. Hardin rubs the back of his neck with his hand. I don't know all this shit with Steph and said Hardin, I'm not going to see Zed again, and unless Steph shows up at the apartment or your father's house, I won't be seeing her either. I still don't think you should go. You have to lighten up a little bit. I sigh, resetting the bun in my hair. Lighten up, he says derisively, as if the idea has never occurred to him. Yes, lighten up. You can't control everything. His head snaps up. I can't control everything? This is coming from you, of all people? 
I laugh. I'm just saying. I'm giving you the Z thing, because I know it's wrong, but you can't keep me from the entire town, because you're worried that I might see him, or some unpleasant girl. Are you done? Hardin asks, leaning against the sink. With the argument or my hair. I smirk at him. You're annoying. He smiles back at me and slaps my behind as I move around him to exit the bathroom. I'm glad he's being somewhat playful. That bodes well for the night. As we cross the hallway to my room, Christian calls up from the living room, Hardin, you here still? Do you coming to listen to some jazz? It's not heavy metal, or whatever, but I don't hear the rest of his words, because I'm busy laughing at the impromptu Christian band's impersonation Hardin is doing. Pushing his chest lightly, I say, go see him. I'll be right out. Back in my room, I grab my purse and check my cell phone. I have got to call my mother soon. I keep putting it off, and she won't stop calling. I have a message from Zed as well. Please don't be upset with me about tonight. I was a jerk, and I didn't mean to be. Sorry. I delete the message and stick my phone back into my purse. My friendship with Zed has to end now. I've been leading him on for too long, and every time I say goodbye to him, I end up backtracking and make the situation worse by seeing him again. It's not fair to him or to Hardin. Hardin and I have enough problems as it is. It bothers me as a woman that Hardin tries to forbid me from seeing Zed, but I can't deny that I'm being a huge hypocrite if I continue hanging out with him. I would never want Hardin to be friends with Molly and spend time with her alone the thought itself makes me nauseous. Zed has made his feelings for me very clear, and it's not fair to anyone if I let the situation with him linger and tacitly encourage him. Zed is kind to me, and he's been there for me a lot, but I hate the way that I always feel like I have to explain myself to him and defend my relationship. Enjoying the fantasy of a great night out with my guy, I descend the stairs, and am surprised that, when I enter the living room, Hardin is standing there with his hands in his hair, looking exasperated. Hell no, he huffs, backing away from Christian. Bloodstained jeans and that dirty shirt aren't appropriate attire in the club, regardless of your connections to the owner, Christian says, pushing some sort of black fabric to Hardin's chest. I'm not going, then. Hardin pouts, letting the garment fall to the floor at Christian's feet. Don't be a baby, just put the damn shirt on. If I wear the shirt, I'm keeping the jeans on Hardin says, negotiating, and looking to me for support. Didn't you bring any clothes that don't have blood on them? Christian smiles, then bends down to pick up the shirt. You can wear your black jeans, Hardin I suggest in an effort to mediate between the two men. Fine, give me the fucking shirt, then. Hardin snatches the shirt from Christian's hands and lifts his middle finger to him as he stalks down the hallway. Maybe a haircut too, Christian shouts after him teasingly, and I can't help but laugh. Oh, would you leave him alone already? I won't stop him from giving you a black eye, Kimberly jokes. Yeah yeah Christian pulls her into his arms and kisses her mouth. I turn away just as the doorbell rings. That will be Lillian. Kim announces while wiggling out of Christian's embrace. Hardin walks out into the living room as Lillian comes through the front door. Why is she here, he groans. He's put on the black button-down shirt, which doesn't look bad on him. Don't be mean. She babysits Smith, and she's your friend, remember? I say. My first impression of Lillian wasn't a good one, but I've grown to like the girl, even though I haven't seen her since we got home from the vacation from hell. No, she's not. Tessa. Hardin. Lillian exclaims, her bright blue eyes beaming, and her smile bright. I'm thankful that she's not wearing the same dress I am, like she was the first time I met her, at the restaurant in Sand Point. Hey. I smile back, and Hardin curtly nods. You look great, she compliments, looking me up and down. Thanks, so do you. She's dressed in a simple cardigan and khaki pants. Okay, if you both are done Hardin complains. Nice to see you too, Hardin. Lillian rolls her eyes at him, and he slightly softens, offering her a half smile. Meanwhile, Kimberly is rushing around the living room, putting on her heels, and checking her makeup in the large mirror above the couch. Smith is upstairs. We shouldn't be gone any later than midnight. Ready, love? 
Christian asks her. And when she nods yes, he spreads his arms wide and gestures to the door. We're driving separately, Hardin announces. Why? We have a driver for tonight, Christian says. I want to drive myself in case we want to leave. Christian shrugs. Suit yourself. As we head out, I get a better look at Hardin's shirt, which is not unlike the one he usually wears when he's forced to dress up. The difference here, however, is that this shirt is covered with a faint, barely noticeable animal print don't say a word, Hardin warns me when he notices me staring. I'm not. I bite my lip, and he groans. It's hideous, he says, and I giggle the entire way to the car. The jazz club is centrally located in downtown Seattle. The streets are full of people, as if it were a Saturday night instead of Wednesday. We wait inside Hardin's car until a sleek black town. Car pulls up next to us, and Kimberly and Christian step out. Rich bastard, Hardin says, squeezing my thigh, before we get out ourselves. With a brisk smile, the bald bouncer unhooks the velvet rope from the silver stand and lets us by. Moments later, Kimberly is leading us through the dark club, showing off various features of the place, while Christian wanders off by himself. Blocks of grey stone serve as tables, and there are groups of black couches accented with white cushions. The only color in the entire club comes from the bouquets of red roses that are sitting atop each massive stone. The soft music playing through the club is relaxing yet stimulating at the same time. Fancy. Hardin rolls his eyes. He looks painfully beautiful under the dim lights. Christian's printed button-down shirt paired with the black jeans make for a deadly attack on my libido. It's nice, right? Kimberly turns around, beaming. Sure, sure Hardin replies. The moment we get near the crowded tables, Hardin's arm wraps around my hips, pulling me closer to him as we walk. Christian is in the VIP section. We have it to ourselves Kimberly informs us. We walk to the back of the club, and a satin curtain is pulled open to reveal a moderate-sized space with more black curtains serving as walls. Four couches form the perimeter of the room, and a large stone rests in the center, covered with bottles of alcohol, a bowl of ice, and various finger foods. I'm so distracted I almost miss seeing Max sitting on one of the couches, across from Christian. Great. Max rubs me the wrong way, and I know Hardin doesn't care for him either. Hardin's arm tightens around me again, and he shoots a glare toward Christian. Kimberly smiles, ever the perfect hostess. Nice to see you again, Max. Max grins. You too, dear. He takes her hand in his and lifts it to his lips. Excuse me. A woman's voice sounds behind me. Hardin and I step to the side, and Sasha prances through the small space. Her intimidating height and barely their white dress help her claim the entire room. Great Hardin says, echoing my thought from seconds ago. He's about as happy to see her as I am to see Max. Sasha. Kimberly tries to appear pleased to see the woman but fails. One of the flaws of Kim's genuine openness and honesty is that it's hard for her to hide her emotions. Sasha smiles warmly at her and takes a seat on the couch next to Max. His dark eyes meet mine as if he's asking me for permission to sit with his mistress. I look away as Hardin guides me to the couch directly across from them. Kimberly takes a seat on Christian's lap and leans forward to grab a bottle of champagne. What do you think of the place, Teresa? Max asks with his smooth heavy accent. Um. I stutter at the use of my full name. I it's nice. Would you two like some champagne? Kimberly offers. Hardin answers for me. I wouldn't, but Tessa would. I lean into his shoulder. If you aren't drinking, I probably shouldn't either. Go ahead, I don't mind. I just don't want any. I smile at Kim. I'm okay, thank you, though. Hardin frowns and takes a full glass from the table. You should have some, you've had a long day. Do you only want me to drink, so I don't ask you questions, I whisper, rolling my eyes as I do so. No. He smiles, amused. I just want you to have a nice time out. That's what you wanted, right? I don't have to drink to have a nice time. When I glance around the room, I can see that none of our company is paying any attention to our conversation. I never said that you did. I'm only saying 
your friend is offering you free champagne that probably cost more than your entire outfit and mine put together. His fingertips dance along the nape of my neck. So why not enjoy a glass? Good point. I lean into him again, and he hands me the long stem glass. But I'm only having one, I say. 30 minutes later I've just polished off my second glass, and I'm contemplating a third in an attempt to not feel uncomfortable while I watch Sasha parading around the small space. She claims she just wants to dance, but if that were truly the case, she could go out to the public area of the club and dance there. Attention whore. I cover my mouth, as if I've said the words out loud. What? Harden, I can see, is bored. Very bored. I can tell by the way he's staring at the black curtain, and his hand is dragging lazily up and down my back. I shake my head in a silent response. I shouldn't be thinking those things about the woman when I don't even know her. All I know about her is that she's sleeping with a married man that's probably enough to know. I can't help but dislike her. Can we go now? Hardin whispers into my neck and brings his other hand to my thigh. Just a little longer I say to him. I'm not necessarily bored, but I would rather be spending one-on-one -on -one time with Hardin than avoiding eye contact with Sasha or her nearly exposed underwear. Tessa, come dance Kimberly suggests, and Hardin tenses. My thoughts flash back to the last time I went out to a nightclub with Kimberly. I danced with a guy just to spite Hardin, even though he was miles away. I was so heartbroken then, so sad, that I could barely think straight. That guy ended up kissing me, and I ended up completely molesting Hardin in my hotel room, after he found Trevor there. It was a huge misunderstanding, but when I think back, the night ended pretty well for me. I don't really dance, remember? I say. Well, come do a lap or something. She smiles. You look like you're falling asleep. Okay, a lap, I agree and rise to my feet. Are you coming? I ask Hardin, who shakes his head. She'll be fine. We'll only be gone a minute, Kimberly assures him. He doesn't look pleased about her stealing me away, but doesn't try to stop her. He's trying to show me that he can lighten up, and I love him for it. If you lose her, don't bother coming back, he says. Kimberly bursts into laughter and drags me through the curtains and into the crowded club. Chapter 115. Harden. Max sidles up to me and asks, where do you suppose she took Teresa off to? Tessa, I correct him. How the fuck does he even know her name is Teresa? Okay, maybe it's a little obvious that's her full name, but I don't like his saying it. Tessa. He smiles and takes a long sip of champagne. She's a lovely girl. I reach for a bottled water from the table and ignore his prodding. I have no interest in talking to the man. I should have gone with Tessa and Kimberly, wherever they went. I try to show Tessa that I can lighten up, and this is where it gets me. Sitting next to this guy in a club with shitty music. I'll be back in a second. The band just arrived, Christian informs us. He tucks his cell phone into his dress slacks and wanders off. Max stands and follows him, giving his date instructions to enjoy herself, to have more champagne. They aren't seriously leaving me alone in here with this chick looks like it's just us two, this Stacy whomever chick says to me, confirming that yes, that's exactly what they just did. Mm I spin the plastic cap of a water bottle across the stone table. So what do you think of the place? Max says it's been packed every night since the opening. She smiles at me. I pretend not to notice, when she tugs at the bottom of her tiny dress to expose her cleavage or lack thereof. It only opened a few days ago. Of course it's been packed. Even so, it's a nice place. She uncrosses her legs, and crosses them again. Could she be any more desperate? At this point I can't even tell, if she's actually trying to come on to me or if she's just so accustomed to being a whore, that it's all automatic. She leans across the table between us. Do you want to dance? There's room in here. Her long fingernails brush against my sleeve, and I jerk away. Are you out of your fucking mind? I move to the other end of the couch. This time last year I would have taken her desperate ass into the bathroom, and fucked her brains out. Now the thought makes me want to vomit on her white dress. What? I only ask to dance. 
maybe dance with your married boyfriend. I snap and reach to push the curtain back, hoping to see Tessa. Don't be so quick to judge me. You don't even know me. I know enough. Yeah, well, I know some stuff about you too, so if I were you, I'd watch it. Do you, now? I laugh. She narrows her eyes at me, trying to intimidate me, I'm sure. Yes, I do. If you knew shit about me, you would know better than to be threatening me right now, I warn her. She lifts a champagne flute and gives me a little salute. You're exactly like they say which is my cue to leave. I push through the curtains to go find Tessa, so we can get the hell out of here. Exactly like who says? Who does she think she is? Christian is lucky that I promised Tessa a nice night. Otherwise, Max would have to answer for his horse mouth. I circle the club in search of Tessa's sparkling dress and Kimberly's bright blonde hair. I'm thankful that this is not the type of place where everyone is swaying around on a dance floor, most of the patrons are seated at tables, making my search that much easier. Finally, I find them standing at the main bar, talking to Christian, Max, and some other guy. Tessa's back is toward me, but I can tell by her posture that she's nervous. Seconds later, another guy joins them, and as I get closer, the first man starts to look more and more familiar to me. Harden. There you are. Kimberly reaches out her arm to touch my shoulder, but I dodge her and move to Tessa. When she turns to me, her blue-gray eyes are wary as they lead my gaze to the guest. Harden, this is my teacher from world religion, Professor Soto, she says, smiling politely. Are you fucking kidding me? Does everyone end up making their way to Seattle? Jonah, he corrects her. He pushes his hand into the space between us for a handshake that I'm too thrown off to deny.